The appointed hour of six o'clock having been reached, I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZDA Chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access this meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the, meeting, the meetings are recorded and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst's YouTube channel and its ZBA webpage. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, Hold on, Maureen, you just changed my screen. Oh, oh. <laughs> just a second. I got to get my side, get it back up again. Excuse me. So sorry. That's all right. I'll get it back up. I didn't realize I wasn't paying attention. Sorry. That's all right. Let's see. Ah, in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 10 of the Special Permit, that is a special permit granting authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. We will re begin with a roll call of the ZBA members in panel for tonight's meeting. Uh, I'm present, but I'm not on the panel until the next two items. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Meadows? Here. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Gilbert? Here. And Ms. Marshall. Here. Also attending tonight is Maureen Pollock, planner. And Maureen, do we have anybody else in the town that's going to appear tonight? Um, not at the moment. Um, the building okay. commissioner may be joining us in a little bit, uh, depending right. on the schedule. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, and convenience and the general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst zoning bylaw is section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification and additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon the people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from, e from the public is gathered followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is where the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applicants applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, the special, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the, day, from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an agreed party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda is a public hearing ZBA FY 2023-05 Otello Hotel Co. Inc. Um, from Richard Pasquilto requests a special permit to modify a previously approved special permit ZBA FY 1964-32 and ZBA FY 1981-46 to incorporate a new site plan and to allow the construction of fiber, fiber telecommunications cabinets as a complementary principal use to the existing residential use under sections 
3.340.1 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 615 Main Street, map, uh, map ID 14B-242, uh, General Residence RG and Commercial COM Zoning Districts. Members sitting for this panel are Mr. Maxfield as the chair, Ms. Parks, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Gilbert, and Ms. Marshall. Next order of business is ZBA FY 2023-04, Redwood Construction, Inc. Requests a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit ZBA FY 2018-21 for the proposed modifications to conditions 1, 6, 11, 12, 19, condition 4, 21, 22, 23, 25, 28, among possible others, as they relate to the proposed changes to the site plan, site amenities, building plans and management plan under section 10.33 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at Renew Amherst, 266 East Hadley Road, map 16D, parcel, thir parcel 13, neighborhood residence RN zoning district. This is continued from our September 8th hearing. Members sitting for this are myself, Ms. Parks, Mr. Maxfield, Ms. Marshall, and Mr. Gilbert. And ZBA FY 2023-06, Loomis Communities, Inc. requests a special permit to modify the previously approved special permits ZBA FY 1985-04, ZBA FY 1988-45, and ZBA FY 1990-8 for the expansion of an existing planned unit residential development or PERD with a proposed construction of the three additional, three addi building additions including a pool pavilion, meeting room, enclosed atrium, and a three-story residential addition with nine new multifamily dwellings. And for amending conditions six, nine, and 10 under ZBA FY 90-8, under article seven and sections 4.4, 10.33, 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at Applewood, one Spencer Drive, map 25A, parcel 43, Outline Residence RO and PERD Overlay Zoning Districts. Members sitting on this panel are myself, Ms. Parks, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Gilbert, and Mr. Maxfield. Um, following that is a, a time period for general public comment on matters not before the board tonight and other, other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Maxfield to, um, to chair the first panel and the first application. There you go, Dylan. Thank you, Mr. Judge. All right, uh, who do we have representing the applicant tonight? Uh, Maureen, you're, mu you're muted. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, uh, Richard um, in attendance. He's representing the applicant. Let me, I need to make him, a, uh, I'm trying to promote you as a panelist, uh, Richard. You might have to press a button. Good evening. Can you hear me? Well, we can. Uh, before we get started, does anybody have any disclosures that they need to make? Uh, hearing none, uh, go ahead if you'd like to go ahead. And uh, actually, before we get started with that, I want to mention that we did the uh, site visit uh, yesterday on the 21st. Uh, at that site visit, we viewed the location where it was going to be, uh, showed what the dimensions roughly looked like. Um, and we're just given kind of a, a, a brief overview of the project. If you wanna go ahead, um, if there's anything else anybody wants to add to that? If not, we can go ahead and uh, start the presentation. And, and would, you, oh, would you like to ahead. mention, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, would you like just to mention the uh, submissions um, that we, I don't know if um, you have that list in front of you. I'm looking here, just a moment. Okay, so I have the applicant submissions here. Uh, is that what we're talking about, Maureen? Yep, and then the, uh, yep, exactly. Okay, we have the um, ZBA FY 2023-05 special permit application. 
received a management plan, an easement sketch, a plan set uh, prepared by Centerline Engineering Services dated September 20th, 2022, which includes a title sheet, a site plan, a compound plan, an equipment plan, uh, details, and then another list of details. Uh, we have the written narrative for 60 or uh, 615 Main Street special permit application for uh, Otelco fiber installation, uh, sample easement photograph, received figure one custom dual bay enclosure 300 by uh, 225, figure two, a fence stock photo, figure three, the propane tank detail, and I uh, received a specification sheet, Optitech Indoor Local Conversions Cabinet, Generation 3 Series. An email from Richard uh, Pasciuto. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right. My apologies. Um, <laughs> got it. Uh, that's dated August uh, 22nd, 2022. And a letter of intent and authorization. Um, do I need to run through the staff submissions as well, Maureen? No, I, I think that fine um right. i guess um the one the one staff uh, submission of um of importance would be comments from the wetland administrator dated today september 22nd and then the special permit decisions from 1964-32 and 1981-46 all right thank you uh with that in mind uh yeah you can go ahead and get started uh, good evening, Chair, members of the board. My name is Rich Prosciutto. I represent Otelco Fiber or Go Net Speed. Um, Otelco Fiber, uh, for the sake of the set of the plans, is a fiber provider that's providing high speed fiber access to the town of Amherst, Massachusetts, similar to Comcast and Fios and other uh, high speed uh, providers. Uh, they're interested in bringing some competition to the, the market and offering services to not only the residents of 615 Main Street, but the residents of Amherst overall. Um, we identified as a part of the process uh, areas where uh, Otelco has access to existing overhead fiber lines. And in this case, uh, the reason 615 Main Street was of a particular interest is Otelco has access to fiber lines that run on Main Street and College Street or College Road. And the goal is to be able to attach to those fiber lines, which they have uh, lease rights to, install equipment and then become a third party uh, provider of internet service or fiber service to the town. So my job as a site acquisition agent for Otelco is to go out, find those locations that best suit their design, uh, determine the zoning requirement and permitting requirement, uh, complete a design, get a lease with the underlying landlord and uh, develop a site. Uh, the site itself is a 20 by 20 foot chain link fenced in area. Um, it's cleared, cleaned, finished with uh, fabric and stone to prevent weeds from coming up. This um, installation here is gonna be improved with two pads for cabinets, um, a little bit bigger than a college dorm refrigerator, a generator should Amherst lose power and a propane backup. We would have hooked up to um, uh, direct gas, but uh, there's no direct gas available now in the town of Amherst. So we uh, we located a spot on the property at 16 Main Street. We submitted a set of plans for review. There was a concern from your conservation commission agent, um, Aaron Jakes, that we might be uh, close to a, a established wetlands that was identified back in 2019. We redesigned the site and moved it to be 132 feet away from the wetlands to the south, uh, 127 feet away from the wetlands to the north, um, and between uh, uh, on an existing right of way on private property in what would otherwise be considered a relatively highly vegetated area. Um, I was with the board uh, yesterday. When I say vegetation, it's more like um, four foot stands of ragweed, um, thistle, uh, and bramble, and it's, it's relatively dense. So the idea would be to where to locate equipment so that it's um, almost invisible to residents and to people driving by. The way the site is designed is we're cut into this um, dense area of weeds 
we install a six foot chain link fence surrounding the 20 by 20 foot compound. We finish it and um, we hook up to our fiber lines and we become a provider to the town. Uh, the, we're on a, a site that was originally permitted for a multi, um, uh, multi-use uh, facility as an apartment complex. Uh, there's an existing gate valve in a closed in area that we originally had located, but we've since moved. Um, and our current location, uh, I think, satisfies uh, the setback requirements um, from side yard, uh, front yard, and wetlands. I got an email later, to, earlier this afternoon, saying that uh, uh, Ms. Jakes was um, was happy with the design we provided because we kind of really jockeyed the uh, the uh, the site to best accommodate um, everyone's concerns and needs. If you see the plan that's up in front of you now, you'll see that um, there's two maple trees, and then between two maple trees, uh, it's the edge of the mowed area. Uh, and when they say mowed, on the right-hand side is, is grass. I mean, very nice lawn. Right at that edge of that line is really dense vegetation. So we're gonna be um, installing that 20 by 20 foot uh, stone finished area inside that um, inside that uh, uh, side yard. And I think that kind of just, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively clean, simple installation. And um, I think that's all I have to, uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Um, with that, I guess we can go into questions here uh, from the panel. Uh, my first question here would be uh, the maple tree that's right in front of that. Is that staying or is that going to be removed? It looked no. like it might have been seeing these plans, it looks like both of those maple trees are staying. Is that the idea? Yeah, both both trees will stay. Um, we'll most likely uh, just do a, um, a stone access way to the to the swing gates. The All we need is uh, an access for a truck with a, a small boom to drop the equipment. And then, because there's no overhead lines that's gonna be installed, there's no you know wires, there's no um, no tower. <laughs> uh, it's, it's uh, we don't need, uh, great deal of height and access. So uh, in speaking with Otelco, they can easily get um, into the site, drop the cabinets and, uh, and not, not mess with the trees. And then um, my second question here is what is the, um, so it's gonna be a, a kind of gravel rock pathway getting there. What is going to be the surface inside that fence area? So we're going to um, cut and clear and grub down probably six inches, remove all the, um, the, the, the seed and base, uh, refill with stone, well, cover with, the, you know, there you go, there's a cross section there, thanks very much, uh, Maureen. Um, you know, there's gonna be a, 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 a compacted grade, then we'll be putting in a, a fabric to prevent weeds from coming up, and then um, stone, the two, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the four slabs for the equipment, and, um, it should be extremely low maintenance. Uh, if you recall on the property, there is a uh, gate valve to the south of our installation with a similar installation. And then two, which I understand had been um, gravel um, areas installed by Aspen Chase for having had provided pods and storage areas. At some point when people are moving in and out, I think they use that area to put a pod, you know, uh, utility storage on grade. Also stoned, also very unweeded, very well kept, um, and uh, it's going to be a similar nature. So when you look from the access way to the fence, there'll be uh, a, a gravel drive, no, uh, no impervious material, um, two swing gates. You open the swing gates, and that entire area will be clean and neat with um, with uh, with stone. And then my last question, I'm going to open it up to the rest of the board here. Um, the device is in there. What what kind of noise would they make? Would it be like an electric buzzing? Would there be no noise? Would it be it, in something intermittent? From the, uh, uh, from the uh, two cabins themselves, there are two small um, cooling fans, um, which will provide no noise outside the lease area. Um, it's, it would be like installing it like a, similar to a very, very similar to a, um, a, a dorm refrigerator. 
And uh, only when they overheat will a small fan come on. Uh, no air conditioning, just uh, regular circulated air. Um, the only real generating, um, uh, anything that's going to generate noise would be the, the propane generator, which is a standard uh, uh, commercial generator, but only to power up those two cabinets. I'm not trying to power up the entire complex. So, and it's fueled by propane, which is also very quiet. So um, this will be the probably the least uh, noise providing um, installation on the property should power go out. Uh, there is going to be uh, an average of a monthly test of that generator. Um, they'll come out, test, well, actually they'll test it remotely just to make sure that it fires up and fueled. Um, but like most installations, there's going to be batteries in the cabinets that'll last for eight hours of a typical shutdown and then a typical outage. Then it should extend past that. The generator will um, fire up and power the cabinets. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open this up. Uh, Ms. Marshall. Thank you. Um, oops. All right. So I don't see the plan anymore, but that's okay. Um, so you've mentioned another piece of equipment, somebody else's on the site, a gate valve, I think. Yeah. I just don't know what that is. What is that? And who is it? it is if it, you expand, if you expand the plan out a little bit and look a little bit south, I think there's a, a, a gate station which typically takes a high pressure gas line and converts it into a low pressure gas line, which is ex ex existing on the uh, on the property prior to our installation. I'm not sure when it was installed, um, but we had identified that as a. So we consider ourselves to be a quasi utility, and when you see a utility use on a property, you kind of want to you know snuggle up to next to it, say utility and utility. It, it usually makes it a uh, you know, better for. Um, residents to know that there's two utilities, mm -hmm. but we didn't, that's part, I'm not sure how the gas company got that in there. They, that was installed when prior to us. Sure, okay, thank you. And my, my other question, um, uh, so your plan is to, to basically hide this yes. uh, in, in the weeds. And they're very beautiful, actually. I think it's quite colorful. I, but since I understand that you're only leasing this 20 by 20 area, do you have an agreement with Aspen to, to not mow, like not mow down all those weeds and then expose expose this to be- No, no, so um, with, with Aspen, um, so we had our original agreement with Aspen to, to install right next to their unit, um, which, which was in a lawn area. And um, we'll, we'll work with Aspen because we only have leased a 20 by 20 foot area. There's, there's no, um, requirement to go beyond 20 by 20 foot. And the idea would be to, to cut it as tight to 20 by 20 foot as possible because typically in a situation like this, the board might require me to put abravites around the side of it, which would we, we would have done. But in this case, I have a six foot chain link fence and, and that um, barrier, and you could see when we were out there, it was very dense. It was very, very organized. Um, and if you just cut in 20 feet on either side, that would be the perfect surround for a six foot, you know, chain link fence. Um, I agree. My concern is whether you don't have control over that vegetation. So do you have, has Aspen agreed not to mow it down? No, well, you're right. A, we don't have control of that vegetation. We only have control of our 20 by 20 foot area. Um, I don't think Aspen Chase is going to change the entire uh, topography of that property now to push all those weeds back to accommodate us. Um, that would be a huge expense for them to, to undertake. And I have no, you know, I'm not in, interested in, in, in clear cutting um, that barrier. It is, when you look at it from the road, it is one beautiful clear line of, of, uh, of growth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's been maintained like that. So uh, I don't think um, Aspen Chase has the intention of cutting that down. That's, I think it's part of the feature of the property. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, questions from uh, other members? All right, uh, seeing none, we'll go ahead and we can open this up to uh, questions from members of the public. Um, if we do that, if you have any questions, please go ahead and use the uh, raised hand function. Uh, we'll go ahead and call on you. Uh, we'll have a chance to speak. Please address your comments directly to the board. And let's see, do we have anyone public comment on this? 
Not seeing any. All right. Seeing none, we can move on past that. Uh, do we want to go ahead, Maureen? Sorry, procedurally, we close the public hearing and move to a public meeting. Is that correct? Uh, no, uh, you could actually just uh, not need to make a motion and um, go into your um, deliberation period, but keep the public hearing open in case um, more information is requested or you would like to um, seek uh, input from the public. Got it. Um, all right. Well, with that in mind, I'll say, you know, kind of looking at this project, um, as far as things as we're concerned about here, I, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, building of the, the 20 by 20 on this lot here. Uh, this doesn't uh, exceed their lot coverage. Am I correct about that, Maureen? I don't think I saw anything about that, but they have the lot coverage to do this. They do. This is a very minor 20 by 20 area. Um, and, and then plus the the little new uh, gravel access uh, strip, um, and uh, it, it's been determined by in, uh, inspection services that that there is um, plenty of um, they don't exceed the lot coverage for this property. Excellent. All right. Uh, in that case, I guess we can go on to uh, conditions and then start reviewing for specific findings here. Am I correct about that, Maureen? Uh, yeah, so uh, if the board uh, would like to go through the sections, uh, we could start with uh, section 3.01. Um, and uh, I can pull up um, some of my notes. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to produce a project application report for this proposal here tonight, but I do have um, some key notes here. Um, so um, I'll, I'll let you, Dylan, uh, run with the show, but the first um, section that you could look at is, is uh, under section 3.01, uh, mm -hmm. the development or operation on a single lot of more than one dwelling or more than one, one of the principal uses described in section 3.3 .3 is expressly prohibited, except where the principal uses are clearly complementary to each other or whether otherwise provided by, the, by this bylaw. Yeah, and I think that, uh definitely meets that threshold. We already have uh, utilities there on that lot allowed in the special permit. Um, and then we have, uh, what is it, 3.3401, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, so the use that's being proposed here under this application uh, would be uh, considered under 3.340.1. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so, uh, which includes uh, communication use, um, uh, excluding any office storage or repair use unless otherwise allowed by the regulations of the district. And so the proposed use, which is a uh, fiber tele, tele, telecommunication is a use permitted by special permit by the ZBA um, pursuant to um, the section 3.340.1 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Uh, and then do we have anything else in 3.3 here? Um, no, those the would, project? Yeah. And yeah. so just to recap about, um, you know, there's, there's an existing principal use on the property, which is Aspen Chase Apartments, which has been there for many uh, decades. And um, and has been approved by the ZBA um, um, uh, many decades ago. And so the applicant is proposing a construction of a fiber telecommunication cabinet as a secondary principal use on this property. And so the board needs to um, you know determine whether it's complementary to one another. Um, in that. Um, so as you said, Dylan, that, you know, there are utility systems on the yeah. property. There's um, the utility towers uh, along the property as well. And, um, you know, the tenants of this property will most likely benefit from the installation of this fiber optic telecommunication because it will provide faster internet and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I believe that we can find, make that finding that this is a complementary use that is providing a utility that will be utilized on this property uh, and beyond. Um, then we have 
Is there anything else from section three or can we move to 10.38? Um, you can move on, but uh, before you get, uh, yeah, actually we can, um, yep, let's move on to 10.38. Got it. Um, so yeah, everything else there, we, we meet the dimensional requirements. Um, Correct, yep. Yep, all right, then we'll go on to 10.38. Um, 10.380 uh, and 381, uh, proposal suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed. Um, we have um, a review here, the applicant proposing uh, fiber telecommunication cabinets, principal use. Um, we, we can make that finding as well for uh, 3.382, uh, 383, 385, and 387. Um, this uh, proposal provides the six foot uh, high fence around the cabinets. The applicant is not proposing any landscape uh, or lighting. So I don't think we have to worry about that. Uh, Ms. Marshall? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to make it explicit, really just for the benefit of the, anyone listening or watching this, that, there, that the applicant is not building a structure. It's not a building, there's no roof, it's just, four pieces of relatively small equipment inside a fence. Yes. That's all. Thank you. And then, um, yeah, we're not, um, yeah, I'm not concerned about the noise. Um, and then we do, we don't have any concerns. I think, yeah, the, as the applicant has stated, the screening there provided by that vegetation, we think that that's adequate. I think so anyways, you, do you agree, Ms. Marshall, of the, uh, the board? All right, wonderful. Yes, uh, great talk. <laughs> uh, point 384, uh, adequate appropriate facilities will be provided for the proper operation of proposed use. Um, finding that utility services are found to be adequate for the operation of the existing and proposed use. So 10.386, uh, proposal ensures that in its conformance with the parking and signage regulations, uh, articles seven and eight respectively. So the applicant proposes the following for the gravel access drive, prepare the subgrade and compact the gravel base with eight inch depth, appropriate grading and drainage with a four inch compacted uh, process aggregate, section 7.3. 101 requires minimum 12 and all this. Um, yeah, and there's no signage proposed here. We'll move on to 10 point. So 10 uh, point. go ahead. If I may. Oh, so um, so section 7 point one, uh, uh, yeah, 7.101 requires that a minimum minimum total of 12 inch depth um, be provided for graining uh, for gr grading and dr drainage. And um, so the applicant um, is only provi providing a subgrade um, with uh, compacted gravel base of um, of an eight inch depth. So mm -hmm. it really should be a minimum of twelve inches, um, not eight. Um, so technically, the board would need um, would need to grant the proposal a waiver from from that um, depth amount or you uh, may wish to ask the applicant to update its plans in order to meet this section. Um, um, and what did, uh, what did the, the building inspectors or uh, inspection services consider on this one? Is this something that they believe is necessary? Because I think for the, the water runoff, I think they would have a better idea of what would be best in this project than, um, than I would, is this something that we should hold off on? Uh, Rob, do you uh, want to yeah. weigh in here? Sure. The um, the bylaws standard uh, design standard requires that 12 inch minimum for the base and then a two inch finished material. Uh, but I think, you know, for the such a limited uh, amount of use that this driveway would get, uh, I think as long as the base materials are appropriate, you know, the subgrade materials are appropriate for when, where they start building that eight inch base from, uh, it should be fine. So I don't have any concerns with uh, a, a waiver being granted. And, you know, I think we, we have the uh, opportunity to address that if we see something in the field with the soils conditions that would suggest something better be done. All right, and then if we want to go ahead and in, improve this section and grant that waiver, we want to include a condition that that would need to be 
uh, approved by uh, your department or would we want to, or is that that's something that's automatically going to be done? I think it'd be appropriate to include in the condition that either an inspection be done uh, prior to placing the uh, the gravel material or we receive a uh, some sort of letter or notice from the engineer for the applicant who would have conducted that type of inspection. Either way would be fine. All right. Um, yeah, I'll, I want to include a condition then that uh, the gravel access drive that the uh, material be approved by um, by our inspection services. Uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to 10.387. The proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site and in relation to adjacent streets, property, and improvements. Uh, the special permitting granting authority deems the proposal likely to have significant adverse impact on traffic patterns. It shall be permitted to require a traffic impact report and the proposed shall comply with sections 11.2437 of this bylaw. Um, yeah, safe vehicular and pedestrian movement is found on the site, uh, 10.388. Um, this finding is not applicable and 10.389. Finding is not applicable as well as 10.390, 10.391, uh, also not applicable to this project. So we'll move on to 10.392. Um, this proposal provides adequate landscape, including the screening of adjacent residential units, providing street trees, landscape islands in the parking lot, um, non-residential units joins the residential district. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it. I'm gonna go, we've already talked about this here. The board needs to determine whether adequate landscaping, including screening of adjacent residential units is provided. Um, we've talked about this. We've determined that the vegetation that is there provides that as well as the fence uh, screening it from the front to the road. We'll move on to 10.393. Uh, lighting is not proposed, so this is not um, applicable to this project. Um, then 10.394, proposal avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. There are no wetland resources associated with buffer within the 100 feet of the project limit work, as we determined in the moving of that. 10.395, uh, 10.396, uh, uh, neither are applicable to this project. 10.397. Proposal provides adequate recreational facilities, open space, and amenities for the proposed use. Uh, at that site, sufficient open space is located on the site. And then lastly, we have 10.398. The proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of this bylaw and the goals of the master plan. Um, and then I think, yeah, board needs to determine whether the proposal meets the applicable zoning bylaw sections, including 3.0, 3.340, 0.1 and 10.30, not 10.38, and possibly uh, 7.9. Have we reviewed 7.9, uh, Maureen? We talked about that. I don't think yeah, that was um, the waiver request uh, regarding the, okay. um, the access, the gravel um, access strip uh, for Excellent. under section 7.101. All right, and then for, for moving to grant the waiver and make findings and include the condition, we want to just have all three of those in a proposal. Am I correct about that, Maureen? Yeah, so uh, we do have, um, staff has uh, created uh, possible conditions for the board's approval all right. of this special permit. So if you would like to review those. Sure, let's go ahead and work through those. Uh, shall be built and maintained according to the approved plans application uh, package any changing shall be reviewed by the building commissioner to determine if uh, submission to the zoning board of appeals is necessary said changes may be reviewed and or approved by the zoning board of appeals in a public meeting uh, or if the changes are significant enough said changes shall require a formal modification of the permit and or condition the approved plans include zba fy 2023-05 special permit application, uh, the management plan, the easement sketch, the plan set prepared by Central Line Engineering Services dated September 20th, 2022. Uh, then we have the title sheet, site plan, compound plan, equipment plan, details, the details again. And then we have the uh, written narrative for 65 uh, Main Street. We have the 
Uh, uh, Dylan, if, go ahead. if you may, I can interrupt you. So uh, these were the submissions that you stated at the beginning. I know, we're, it, it feels redundant going through them again. So you could just say as submitted. Uh, as submitted prior, perfect. Stated, we'll, yeah, we'll there you the go. You can save yourself <laughs> your voice a little bit. Excellent. All right, so before the issuance of any building permits, the applicant shall obtain all necessary permits from the Amherst Department of Public Works. Uh, tree protection of the two existing maple trees nearest to the proposed cabinet shall be in place prior to starting uh, construction. In the event that either of these two maple trees nearest to the proposed cabinet are damaged or die as a result of the construction under this permit, the applicant shall replace the said tree. Uh, the special permit shall expire within two years of the date that this is filed with the town clerk, unless it has been uh, both recorded at the Registry of Deeds and substantial construction or use has commenced within that two year period of time. And then uh, that last condition, uh, if you want to include that in there, Maureen, for condition six here, that um, that uh, gravel driveway that we uh, be inspected, be uh, approved by inspection services. Yep. All right. I I'll add that in. Any other conditions from any other board members? Uh, if not, then I would entertain a motion that we uh, make the special findings um, to approve with uh, conditions and that we also grant a waiver um, for the requirements under 7.9. Am I correct about that, Maureen? That's everything we need? Right. Yep. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Thank you. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Motion and a second. Um, I will go ahead and do a roll call vote. Uh, chair votes aye. Uh, Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. All right. Motion passes five to zero. Special permit is approved with conditions. Uh, thank you so much for coming on in. Folks, uh, good luck. Have a great evening. Thank you much, everyone. Good night. Bye now. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and pass it back over to uh, Mr. Judge. Steve, are you talking? You're muted. Unmute. So um, what I said was that we're moving to the second item, which was ZBA FY 2023, um, Redwood Construction Inc. requesting a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit ZBA FY 2018-21 for the proposed modifications to conditions 1, 6, 11, 12, 19, Condition 4, 21, 22, 23, 25, 28, among possible others, as they relate to the proposed changes to the site plan, site amenities, building plans, and management plan under section 10.33 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at Renew Amherst, 266 East Hadley Road, map 16D, parcel 13, parcel 13 neighborhood residence RN zoning district. This is continued from our September 8th meeting. Um, what I'd like to do is go through the submissions that we have received since that time um, and then to um, discuss each of the, we'll go through the submissions we've, we've seen at that time. Then I'd like to specifically um, deal with the response to the requests that we had to the applicant, run through his responses, and then um, open it up for additional questions. And then we can continue to look at conditions um, before we go back to findings. So with that is our, our plan. Let me just run through the, the new submissions that we've received since our last meeting. We have an email from Mr. White dated September 15th, uh, a list of our requests, uh, and, and his response to a list of our requests dated November 8th. Plan set, um, LC 200 through 202, dated September 14th, uh, which includes planting snow, uh, snow storage plans, 
management plan addendum updated September 15th, an email from Tyler White dated September 15th, the building plan set prepared by O'Sullivan Architects, um, the first floor, second floor, and third floor, and bicycle rack specification sheet. Additional town staff submissions include a project application report dated September 21st, ZBA request from us to on the public hearing follow-up, uh, email exchange between the building inspector um, Edmund Smith and planner Maureen Pollock dated between dated between September 9th and September 12th, which includes six attachments, email between the police captain Gabriel Ting and planner Pollock dated September 9th through September 14th, attachments as well to that. Um, email from, we received today an email from Mr. Mark Satterfield. Um, we have to note that, as we did before, that the um, applicant's waiver requests for plan submissions include lighting site and traffic impact statements. So um, what I'd like to do, unless there's anybody that has any questions, what I'd like to do is run through the applicant's response to our requests from the last meeting. And so let me let me start off with you, Mr. White. Um, I'm assuming you're the you're going to speak for the um, applicant. That is correct. And um, there's two others who uh, from my team uh, who will be presenting as well. Rachel Window looks like she was just promoted. And then um, David O'Sullivan should be on there. Is he, is he here, Maureen? OK, Carlos <coughs> um, Yeto, our engineer, was planning on being here, but he had a, a medical procedure um, and isn't able to make it tonight. So um, he's, he's All right. OK, so the first request we had was um, so let's get each of those names down for the record and then we won't have to interrupt uh, again. So Mr. White, give us your name and address for the record. Sure. Tyler White, 2082 Michelson Drive, Irvine, California. Great. And is it Rachel? Um, name and address for the record, please. Hello, my name is Rachel Window and my address is the same. It's 2082 Michelson Drive. And Mr. O'Sullivan. Uh, David O'Sullivan, O'Sullivan Architects, uh, 606 Main Street, Reading, Mass. Great, thank you. So the first request we had was for ten tenant demographics. Uh, your response is that you're not legally, you're legally prohibited from collecting that information. And so therefore you are unable to provide us with the requested demographics. What we asked for were how many units had children under age 18 at the meeting. I think it was, um, one of your team suggested that about 35% of the units contained families, which isn't the same as having children. You have a family of two adults, but that was the discussion was about uh, children. Um, that I'm, I'm unaware of any legal impediment to you telling us how many kids are on your property. <laughs> so, so explain I, that to me. I can I can have Rachel weigh in. Um, Per my discussion, we have a separate property management group. And when I requested this information, um, that was the response that I received is that that they were not able to request information on um, the minors that reside within the complex. Rachel, is there any other information that you can provide um, on that issue? Thank you so much, Tyler. No, there's no other additional information. That is correct. And speaking with our local uh, legal counsel, since children are not considered to be part of the household and aren't considered in the technical head of household count or occupant count um, in the Amherst, um, excuse me, the town laws that I've seen and what the lawyer had seen, we don't have that information. We don't collect minor children information. Um, in part of our leasing process. So while we would love to provide it, I just don't simply have that information um, since we're not permitted to collect it. Mr. Mora, does that comport with your understanding of Amherst law? Well, I don't, I don't think it's a matter of Amherst law. It sounds like what we're being told is that the applicant doesn't have that information. Um, I, I have no idea, you know, what, what to, um, you know, uh, suggest at that point, if they're telling us that they don't have that information, I think it's uh, uh, pretty standard, typical information available through census collection data, 
there's probably other ways to get it. Uh, the applicant certainly could have made an effort to try to get it uh, from the census information uh, or, or uh, school department or something. You know, I think the request here, from what I understand, is that uh, the board had asked for uh, a count of number of units that uh, would have school aged children uh, residing there. Uh, that's expected to be a pretty es well, you know, rough estimate of the number of uh, minors that are living there. We're not looking for any specific information about uh, mm -hmm. children. So I, I think it was, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm not. I wasn't at the earlier meeting, so I'm not sure what the yeah. what the purpose that of was the discussion that was, the was. But it seems like it's uh, a, a pretty uh, legitimate request and could be responded to. And, with the and I think I. If I may respond, I think that the issue is we can provide an estimate, and that was provided last week. Or, excuse me, the well, last that was week. a guess, Mr. Mr. White. That was that was a guess. That was Cor by somebody who who doesn't. Cor cor correct. It was an correct, it was right? an estimate. It was a guess. It was an estimate, and yep. and to get to, in, in, in able to in order to provide the exact data that was requested, um, our council is telling us was. In order to provide that exact information that we, we were not able to provide so we can certainly provide estimates and um but exact data is is what we do not have so mr white what i would like to see i'd like to know if the estimate by your um who was the who was the guy that was on the last week i want to make sure i get his name right uh, yes um, mario martinez mario so if the estimate by Mr. Martinez was wrong, I'd like to know that. So what I would like you to do is talk to your local management people, ask them what their estimate is for the number of households that have children under the age of 18, uh, number of units that have children under the age of 18. If that's 35%, that's great. If it's 20 or 40 or 50, it does relate to the, to the changes to the um, recreational material, to the amenities that are being provided. That's the reason we're interested in the, in the information. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We can. We can. We're ha happy to confirm confirm that estimate. Well, but you will ask. Okay. You'll you get that information from on site people. I would suspect. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. The second. Um, considering uh, that you're going to reach out to your local property management company um, that have an understanding of you know. Um, you know, of this property, the tenants, the amenities that you provide. Um, it is it reasonable to ask for a you know a, an actual count, not an estimate. So it's an you know a real real data, a real real factual information than um, oh. an estimate. Rachel, would you mind weighing in? Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually local. So my office is technically out of the corporate office in California, but I actually live just up the road in New Hampshire. So I can definitely um, get that information probably this week for you and with a confident number that I think you guys will feel confident in as well. So it'd be an accurate number, not an estimate. You got it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So we're looking for an accurate number on the number of units that have school aged children under 18 years of age. Thank you. The second is uh, community gardens. Um, we asked to consider keeping one of two proposed community gardens for tenant use and to get your response to that. Um, and you agreed to, to keep one of two proposed community gardens. You have a, a site plan that um, shows a possible position of that or placement of that community garden. Um, one of the things that I, that I have since discovered is that there are groups that, one of the things that, you, that your folks said at the meeting was that it, you don't know if it was gonna be used and that you, it'd be kind of ridiculous to set aside this community garden and, and not have it used. And that maybe tenants wouldn't like it or they wouldn't know about how to, using it, how to use it. So one of the, we've, there are groups around that help people, especially um, multifamily developments to um, manage use um, community gardens. Uh, would you be willing to work with a group such as Healthy Hampshire, which is a group that I've, I've, I've seen on the, I've seen their website, um, 
help to work with them in trying to formulate a program that not only introduces people to the community gardens but helps them manage it. Sure, we'd be we'd be happy to to reach out and to connect with that group. So we might. So would you be? Um, I, I think we might condition uh, place a condition on the extension of the of the time frame on your um, application to. Re um, require you to, to meet with the um, with healthy hand or to meet with some local agency that does this kind of work. Sure. What's the size? Can you tell us what the size of your plot is going to be? It was, I don't remember there being um, a size on a number of foot feet or it's just as a red line. What's the size that you expect it to be? Do you know? Do you have something? Are you talking? Are you mind? talking about the the, ind the individual plots within the community well, garden or the community garden? No, the community garden itself. Um, I I don't have that number offhand. Um, that would have been a question for Carlos. I can who's not able to make it. I can certainly um, provide that information uh, after this meeting. Okay, size of garden number. Oh. Okay. All right. Any questions from board members on that item, that response? All right. I, so, Mr. Judge? Yes, Ms. Marshall. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe Maureen can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the town of Amherst itself has some community gardens, and I maybe it's the sustainability coordinator or somebody in conservation. I think, I mean, I think the town has some expertise in this. I could be wrong. Um, right, there is, you know, I, I, to be honest, um, I wish I knew more information. I know Stephanie Ciccarelli, uh, who is our um, director of our sustainability right. uh, department, um, does work with the Agricultural Commission and um, does have connections with uh, uh, Food justice and, and food security uh, programs and and whatnot, but I don't know the particulars of of uh, town staff's involvement with um, providing guidance or um, on community gardens or uh, programming or how to go about implementing a community garden. I do know that the town of Amherst does work uh, in partner with Healthy Hampshire or or, or, or it was called. Yeah, Healthy Hampshire. It was at the nonprofit that yeah. Steve had mentioned. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but I can certainly um, give Tyler uh, Stephanie Ciccarelli's contact information um, to talk to to see if there's additional resources through the town. But I, I don't have the particular information on that right now. I think I was heard that the, I heard that the town is even may, recently made or will make some new community gardens. Um, over near the Fort River School, I think. So there, there, there must be some people in town who know about this. <laughs> so, so there are there are additional uh, resources available to the applicant to help manage and encourage the use of community farms if that's and gardens if that's something that the tenants desire, both town and as well as nonprofits. So that's good to know. Thank you. Any other questions regarding the gardens? Um, the next response was on bicycle racks. You you agreed to put up uh, 11 bicycle bicycle racks or an additional 11 bicycle racks in addition to the two that are already there, so a total of 13. And it's it's I didn't see the design for the footprint. I know that it was submitted, but I just don't have a copy of it. I might I might have dropped it or misplaced it. Is it the same as what we saw as what was on site? Um, I'm not exactly sure to, to tell you the truth. I can, um, if you'd like, I can share my screen and provide the spec yep. sheet. Yep. Okay. So this image on the right is is uh, from the spec sheet that that we submitted, and um, can can hold six bikes. Um, per bike rack. Um, yep. If you'd like, I can also go through and show all of the 13 locations of the bike racks on our on our plans. If you'd like to see that, 
Yes, I would. But before we leave this, uh, are these then on a pad? The metal is the metal connected to cement pad. That's my that, that's my understanding. There's a small pad that uh, the metal is attached to. The, the okay. rack is attached to. And okay. um, yep. And because of that, and we'll get to this in a, in a bit. But our yep. our um, our lot coverage was increased slightly in order to to take into account that. that. Yep. That's right. Okay, so show us the um, the locations. Sure. <clears throat> so as mentioned, there's um, we initially submitted plans for two bike racks in our plans, uh, but of we'll we'll go ahead and add eleven additional ones for for a total of thirteen, and we can start on the northern portion of the site. Um, this uh, symbol is the bike rack symbol. So there's oh. There's generally one per per building. Uh, one right there. All right. Is that two racks? Why are there two lines? Is it? It's just a symbol, I think. It's just there's not two bike racks there. It's just a symbol you use. Right, that's right? just the, that's oh, just. Oh, okay. Symbol. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. So, no problem. One right there. Two. Here, I guess I can get my pointer to point it out. Number two. Three. Um, you know, I did see this on the drawings, and I didn't know what those were because it wasn't. Yep. It was the the key wasn't. It wasn't identified in the key. Okay. Here's number four. Yep. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. Got it. Okay, so essentially every building has at least one. Correct. And there's some buildings that are essentially attached to each other where we've mm -hmm. provided uh, additional ones close together to be able to. To, to handle the amount of bikes there. But um, based off of, you know, the um, these bike racks we're, pro we're providing, believe that that will be sufficient to handle, um, or I guess to mitigate the problem that was observed on site when there's bikes left um, on the ground. Great. Any questions from board members about bike racks? All right. The next re request was to show the location uh, of, to add picnic tables and trash recycling bins by the grill stations. Can you, and you have um, responded that you've added one additional picnic table and two sets of trash bins. Can you show us that? Correct. Here's, here's the screenshot from the updated plans. Uh, down here on the bottom left is the picnic table, um, and right adjacent are the, the trash cans. Uh, we've also added another set of trash cans up here to the north of, of the playground. So how many trash cans, uh, how many picnic tables are, uh, new, now, are added? Now there, we, we added one for, for a total of three. Here's one. Two and three. Okay. And now they're um, we added and we added the two sets of trash cans, which were not uh, included in our previous plans. Are there questions, concerns about trash cans and the picnic tables? If not, next question was regarding, um, I think it's snow, if I'm correct? That's correct. Snow storage, yep. I'm disappointed that, that Carlos is not here. I had some questions that may come from that. Um, so you're proposing to, now, first of all, your management plan says you're gonna try to take the snow off site. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, 
And so when you can't, until you can take it off site, or if you can't take it off site, um, you're going to, you're going to store it along the tree line and then next to the egg, the curb cut. Is that correct? So let me pull up our snow uh, storage plans. So we went ahead and updated uh, per the request of the board. We updated our plans to show uh, snow storage locations until it can be taken off site. Um, as you can tell here, um, that this uh, planning on storing the snow um, um, around this this parking area right here, north of the new building, mm -hmm. uh, and then also around the the park the the new parking lot south of the the new building as well. Um, and forgive me, as a Californian, snow is pretty pretty foreign to me, so I can't. I don't have all the technical details on snow storage and uh, and and Carlos can if there's any other questions that that I might not be able to provide or Rachel might not be able to provide um, we can certainly check in with Carlos to get any of these questions answered. But these my, my first question is and I, I don't have the answer to this but as a Minnesotan and we tried not to store the snow, especially if snow was going to be around for a while, and especially if it contained chemicals around the trees. Um, it wasn't something that was an ironclad rule, but it was something you always tried to avoid. And we always, we did try to avoid having it um, near exits and entries of parking lots because of, you wanted, didn't want it to get so high that it obstructed traffic. I mean, that is already taken care of by other, the traffic obstruction is taken care of by other conditions. But I wouldn't, I would wonder if what Carlos would, how he would uh, um, respond to a question of whether this is, um, it would damage the trees, if that's an appropriate place to store the, the mm -hmm. snow. And, and uh, we're happy to, to make any modifications to this snow storage plan that the board sees fit in order to have a more uh, efficient and safe snow removal and storage plan. But and if I may, this is this is Rachel again. I apologize. I am a New Englander, and I do the snow removal contracts for our entire New England portfolio. We do not utilize any harmful chemicals such as calcium chloride. We always utilize a landscape safe um, salt plus a combination of sand um, that our uh, landscapers recommend as well. Um, so if that's something that you would like to see, you know, documentation of or have a say, and of course the quantities you know involved in that, we'd be more than happy to uh, provide that as well. Rachel, do you pile it up by trees? Uh, at this site, no, it's it's actually more difficult, in my opinion, to pile up here. We've done a lot of relocation off site. Once we receive a threshold inch above roughly 20 inches, give or take, over um, an accumulative period of about a week, which honestly hasn't happened since we've owned the site um, due to, you know, a number of factors in the world like global warming. So we haven't had as much snow, but we have plans in place at all of our sites to do relocation off of the community. Okay, so you relocate after you relocate after an inch. That's what you're telling me. So we have a one inch right? trigger. We have a one inch yep. trigger, and then we pull, uh, push the snow. And then once we get accumulate accumulation of over thirty inches in a one week period, is when we would do any type of removal away from the property. Well, Other than that, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot found, of snow. <laughs> we found that uh, the pile. Thirty inches like I said, in a week. Yeah, but we also aren't piling up in the trees. We haven't had to do that at this site. I've again been to the site very, very numerous amounts of times, especially when there's been snow incidents um, or snowfall events that have occurred. Um, and we've pushed against the grass on, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but we pushed more against grass um, and, and kind of compounded on top of kind of a hill, um, more so than hitting any tree lines. But again, if, if a contingency is that we don't do that and we just do removal, that's an option we can do with our snow removal provider as well. We can easily change our contract to reflect that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome, no problem. Are there any questions from members about snow removal? I have, I have one. I'm just curious yes, about Ms. Marshall. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm uh, just curious about the, and maybe Mr. Judge will answer the, the concern about the trees. Is it that they may be damaged by the heavy equipment that's pushing the snow and then trying to grab more, it? It's more the it? chemicals. Or the, more the chemicals. Okay. 
that was my initial concern. And also just if, if it stays there, I mean, snow, snow does pile it's up in the winter. That's what happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, yeah, it, but it's more the chemicals and, and also potential equipment if it's, if the operators aren't careful, okay. but I, yeah, but we could also, if trees are damaged by the snow removal, there's a way to require that they be replaced. So that could be also another consideration as well. Other questions regarding snow? Uh, this is Rachel again, I apologize. And we also have a contingency in all of our contracts that any damage to property or landscaping has to be resolved and repaired by the snow removal company um, at the end of each season. Okay, thank you. All right, lot coverage is the next question. And it seems that um, you're gonna need to go up a, a one quarter of 1% from where uh, you were because of the, principally because of the cement pads for the, for the bike rack and the um, picnic tables. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I think that's a direct result of the concerns that we've expressed in your response for them. I'm not bothered by a one quarter of 1% increase over the site coverage, although it is, um, it, it is, you know, it's non-conforming, but um, it's, it's above that. The next response was on affordable units. You had proposed four affordable two bedroom units, uh, five affordable two bedroom units and one affordable three bedroom units. We asked you to consider two, we have four and two, two affordable one, three bedroom units. Your response is that you would prefer to stay with five and one. Um, we also went to our um, to our planning department to look at the the um, market in the area as to what's needed uh, between two and three bedroom units. And Nate Malloy is, is one of the our housing experts and works with their affordable housing trust and does a lot of work on housing. Um, submitted a an, an assessment of, to the board. His recommendation is that he is comfortable with five and one, um, not four and two. Um, if you have that information, um, board members, have you reviewed that piece by Nate? Where he talks through that oh, there, there's tremendous needs for rental housing, both two and three bedroom rental housing, and there's not enough in town. And he's comfortable to that. And I, and my inclination had been to think that the three bedroom units were in such uh, need that we should require that. But it's his belief that the need is for both four and both for two bedroom and for three bedroom and, and the need for five, three bed, five, two bedrooms would, would be uh, a sufficient um, for our needs in town. Um, Mr. Judge? Yes, uh, is, um, Nate also, on, is Nate here? No, he couldn't make yeah. tonight's meeting, but um, he, I just wanted to point out, he um, also indicated in his email to the, to the ZBA that um, since um, the, the, um, there are more than 21 units proposed in the 47 unit building, uh, a minimum of 12% of the total unit count. Um, there's two asterisks where it says when six, uh, and, and this is under section 15.11 uh, of the zoning bylaw, when six or more affordable rental units are required under this bylaw, 20% of the affordable units shall be affordable to households earning 60% area median income AMI or less as calculated by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development or any successor uh, agency. And so because of that language right there that I cited from the bylaw, there needs to be uh, one of the total six affordable units needs to be uh, affordable to a household earning 60% AMI or less um, for our Springfield metropolitan area. Um, and then the five other units would be at 80% um, AMI. So the board uh, would, should um, place a condition that specifies that, um, or, or that's what the planning right. department recommends is to include a condition about the 60% AMI for the one unit. Mr. White, are you familiar with that requirement? Yes. You think I'm familiar with it. Yep. Can you repeat that question? 
are you familiar with that requirement and um, are you prepared yes. to yep. do that? Correct. Okay. Yep. We're, we're prepared to follow uh, uh, that condition. Ms. Marshall, you have your hand up. Yes, just to note that um, I, I think we skipped over the EV charging station. Oh, thank you very much. I did that not was mean right, to do that. right after the snow, right? <laughs> right after snow. Oh, it's right below there. I yeah. was thinking that Mr. I would think that Mr. Meadows would have <laughs> 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 waiting for him to say something there. Nope. Uh, EV charging station. We asked about. Um, consider providing a minimum of one EV charging station on the, on the new parking area, the 43 space. You'd agree to do that. Um, so when Could we, we discussed this- the overall sheet? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could yep, we sure. see the overall sheet? So the, the proposed location for the EV charging station uh, would be uh, in this parking lot south of the new building. Uh, right, oops, not, not uh, cooperating with me, but kind of on this, this southern portion right here of, of the parking lot. Um, and the reasoning uh, uh, behind that location has to do with the, you know, per my discussion with Carlos is that this is one of the only areas of the parking lot that has uh, one that is closer to the building, but also has some green space behind it to allow for installation of the of the charging station. Um, and so that was the the thinking there uh, behind its location. Mr. Meadows, you would raise this issue um, regarding this. Is this something that you're Well, Mr. Meadows isn't serving on this panel, I guess. So I'm, I, I know he's raised the issue in the past. Um, yeah. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I think when we talked about this two weeks ago, were we not looking at the north parking lot? And it, it, I mean, it's, it's fine to put it in this lot, but. Uh, another, yeah. if, if I may. Um, huh? One of the reasons too that we placed it here is its location proximate to um, a, a transformer or the electrical source. Um, based off my understanding, this location um, was such that it was it was close enough to the electrical source that made it, I guess, more uh, financially practical to locate it here rather than in a different location. Okay. So there is just there is just one and now it's here. Correct. Got it. Thank you. All right, we've dealt with lot coverage, we've dealt with the form affordable units. We have that's the submission. Judge? Yes. Uh, I had um, a, a question uh, regarding the EV charging station. Uh, I believe, um, and Mr. Mora can certainly um, probably speak better to this, but um, I believe there is a state regulation that may require that there is a five foot aisle next to the EV charging station. And if that is the case, uh, would, you know, would the site plan need to be updated uh, to reflect that? And um, as that may, you know, have a, a minor, domino effect of, of affecting how many parking spaces are provided total, but perhaps not. That would prove or disprove whether maybe a, a parking space would be lost or or maybe there would be no change in, in the number of parking spaces. I, so I can, more, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Mr. White. Um, ahead. I, we do have this small, you know, we would have to go. I, I can go back and check with Carlos on on the relevant codes here with EV charging stations in an aisle proximate to the to the station. I know we do have this little uh, patch right here, um, right next to the proposed station that could be an option to locate that aisle. But that's something that I would need to confer with Carlos on.
All right. Um, is there a way to, um, Maureen, does that satisfy your, your concern or should we have something, do we have to have a condition that says the um, plans have to be modified to reflect any state requirements for um, a five foot? I mean, they'd have to, the plans would have to reflect the state law requirements for the EV station anyway, I would think. So I don't know that we need another condition to do that. But if we do, um, please let me know and we'll consider it. You know, I believe we included a possible condition that gets into um, if any sort of um, minor changes uh, need to be um, provided yeah. in, in the parking area due to the uh, the layout of the EV charging station that that could be done uh, administratively. So perhaps that that handles this topic. Okay, Miss Marshall. I don't understand what is meant by five foot aisles. Can you just briefly explain? Yeah, so what you know, is... a good uh, visual would be for um, an ADA parking space. Um, mm -hmm. You typically see like. Um, the parking space next to where the driver opens the door, there's a sort of buffer. There's not mm -hmm. a parking space, there's a buffer. Um, so picture that, but it's it's not an ADA space. It would be the EV charging station. And then next to it, there would be um, a room for, uh, there would be the parking space and then the, uh, the aisle would be a buffer um, to provide for the user of the charging station. I, I, I was just made aware of a, a possible regulation on this. You mean to walk to to bring the cord to the to plug it in? I believe so, but and you wouldn't know which side of the car. I mean, well, anyway. Okay, thank you. But, <laughs> it, but if there's but if there is a state regulation that requires it, okay. you'd have to have this, right? <laughs> it would have to comply with it and it have to be reflected in the drawings. So um if i think we i don't think we need to address this specifically unless you d determine something else ms pollock um Is mr mora has raised his hand yes mr mora yes so what we're what we're trying to do here is make sure that there's universal access to the charging stations so the accessibility laws that we enforce uh through the building code will require that one, if there's only one, the charging station have access to it. Uh, so it's very similar to a access, uh, handicapped accessible parking space that you see striped. It doesn't need to be striped in the same way. It doesn't receive the signage and it isn't uh, you know, restricted parking to somebody with a placard, but it meets all the clearance and space requirements so that somebody with the need to access through the aisle uh, has the ability to do that and and not have to you know work between really tight fitting car spaces to get access to the charging station uh, the the code doesn't go further to to um, designate which side it's on uh, you know it doesn't do that for the accessible spaces either you know whether you drive in or back in uh, isn't addressed in in the code as long as it's there and available to be used uh, reasonably, you know, properly, safely, and, and accessed by all users. Uh, you'll often see in larger parking areas that uh, the EV charging station will be placed right adjacent to a access aisle that's also serving an accessible space on the opposite side. So it gets a dual purpose uh, and, and it saves a little space. That can't happen here and doesn't often happen when there's only one or so few accessible parking spaces. So I think the issue here is just to acknowledge that either the parking layout will change, a space count might be reduced, or there'll be a little bit more uh, hard surface created so that the aisle can be placed next to this, uh, this parking area. Thank you. The last item, uh, deals with um, police reports um, and activities uh, and the amount of time and the amount of the number of times police have been called to the um, the property. So when you presented last uh, two weeks ago, um, you accurately said we had no, we found no police reports of any 
um, on a, of, any, of anything at the site during the time you owned it and had managed it. And that was accurate because the police, we've since learned the police have stopped publishing their lists uh, in uh, 2019. So you, you couldn't go to the website and find it. But we asked them, I specifically asked at that time, uh, and I think it was um, your colleague who responded that I had a hard time believing that in 18 months you hadn't had any, any kind of um, need or any disturbances or any kind of need to call the police or haven't had or if you hadn't called the police if that was indeed the case how did you handle things in your um internally for your management company subsequent to that and he responded that no we hadn't had any police we haven't had any way we haven't had any any um um difficulties with he called them nefarious characters didn't have any nefarious characters on property Subsequently, we talked to the police and asked them to list for us the um, calls that they and their activity at this site. And so I looked at that and I took the calls that they had made from, I used April 1st, 2021 and forward. And in that time period, in that time period from April of 2021, when you took over management, there were over um, 200 calls of the police to this site. Over 200 calls of police to the site. They went through, now some of these are, are uh, just drive-bys and they see something and they report it. Some of these are serious. They gave a list of the kinds of, of uh, calls that they've had. They range from, the most common is uh, uh, medical emergencies, but there's breaking and enterings, there's breaking and entering and, um, and vehicle theft, there's assisting businesses, there's two rapes, only one during your time. There's, a, I mean, a call about a rape. There's robberies, um, and there's a, a security checks, which I'm not really sure what it is. Um, but those numbers are vastly different than what was represented to us at the last meeting, at the last meeting. And I'm troubled by that, Mr. White. Um, I'm very troubled by that because we, as citizens, we try to respond we do our best to try to um, make our judgments based on the assurance or the assumption that you are providing the applicant is providing us with their best possible information and it seems to me that you did not in preparation that your firm in preparation for this meeting did not take the time to talk to the local people the local management about police uh, presence and police activity in that development and as a result we were given the impression that you had managed it with no police presence for the last 18 months. There's at least 200 calls. There's over 200 calls in that. That's, you know, that's 10 a month. Um, that's one more than one a week. Now, a couple of possibilities here. They all took place when you didn't have people on site. They took place at night. Or they took place on Sunday when you didn't have people around, or you just didn't, or that just wasn't checked by your, by your staff to get the local knowledge that we need. So um, I'd like to know, I'm, I'm not inclined, I'm not like to know, I'm not inclined to deal with the, um, your request to remove the condition that there be a security officer on site. I think that it's um, this level of, of police presence indicates that there is a value to having police uh, having a security guard there and in talking to the police they have found in other cases that indeed it does um, improve the conditions of the of the project of the of the residents uh, when there is private security during the most um, uh, the most likely times for there to be disturbances but so i would like your response about um if to that concern that I have, number one, about not talking to the, the local people and getting the local information from your management company, and two, whether you, um, your thoughts on the uh, requirement to have a security company for the year to f find out what it's like and to report back to us after a year when you have a security a private security company on property. Sure. So let me address your first your first question. Um, so 
in, in preparation for our, our public hearing uh, two weeks ago and for the public hearing today, we were in consultation with our local property management group. And Rachel, um, in a minute, can can share her thoughts on this as well. Um, but that is that is what was was represented to us from local property management is that based off their records that their uh, the incidents that did happen were not ones that um, were such that nefarious actors needed to be um, needed to be um, um, that that the police presence needed to, was needed on site in order to to help mitigate some of these nefarious actors. Um, that was that was what was was told to, to us from property management. Um, and in a minute, I, we can kind of go through um, the the police data to show um, what actually did happen. It, you're correct. There were. Um, and you were a little bit more generous. You started April 1st, 2021. Um, I, I counted yep. from, from March 10th, which is the day after we closed on the property. There were 227 calls um, from March 10th, 2021 until when this data was pulled, I think, um, February 14th or so. Excuse me, September 14th. I'm sorry. So about yep. 18, 18 months worth of time. Um, 23 or 10% of those calls were security checks and per discussion with the police department, those were uh, uh, regular monitoring checks, I guess, patrol checks that were done by the local police department as part of their normal patrols and they would log those. That's 10% of those calls. The, the other 90% were not in, initiated by police, um, but were based off calls from on-site or calls from um, a, a third party to assist. And I wanted to highlight the, the, the cases that, um, or the reasons the police were called out of, the, out of those 204 calls over the last 18 months to dig into the data and figure out what exactly were the police called to do. Um, because the big picture here is whether or not a security guard, a weekend security guard would help to mitigate um, these calls. And so uh, what I have on the screen is a graph of all of those two, the all of 227 calls, um, but the ones that were uh, where there's 10 or more calls I've listed out in red uh, below. So 22 assist business business slash agency. Um, based off my discussions with the police department, those calls are for if a third party agency calls in for help, uh, such as um, the fire department or a different agency that, that needs police help on site, the police respond to that. So that's not necessarily a call from um, a resident on site or someone that is that uh, is is calling from on site to need police help. So that's really a, a call in from another agency um, that needs help. Okay, correct. A call in from another agency that correct. needs police help. Correct. Um, the next one, which is the highest reason for calls, was emergency medical service. So obviously, if uh, someone had a, a medical issue you know, as is common all around the United States is that police typically accompany um, or oftentimes will accompany um, some of these emergency medical call service calls. Um, so that's 35. 20 is follow up. So if there was a previous issue where they were on site before, um, then the police um, wanted to check up on that issue, they would come back and, and address the situation. Uh, 23 noise complaints, um, 19 security checks, which is, as mentioned before, just the normal patrols, 19 still alarms, um, and 11 suspicious um, 
I guess, uh, su suspicious persons. Um, so I think from in from our, our our standpoint, yes, there were a lot of calls, 227. Uh, but when you break it down, um, most of these calls, in our opinion, and this is our opinion, uh, would not have been mitigated by a weekend security guard. And so um, that's kind of my response to the to the first question. I'll also let Rachel weigh in kind of on um, maybe any, I guess some of the, and what, what you pointed out is we represented two weeks ago that, you know, by all accounts that there really wasn't much police presence needed on site. Um, I'll turn it over to Rachel to kind of share her thoughts on what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis there on site um, in terms of security and, and any police needs. Thanks, Tyler. Um, no, definitely agree with everything you just said. Again, I live about, depending on traffic, like an hour away. I'm on the site at least once a week, sometimes more. Um, I'm also on the site at night um, sometimes, just if we're working late on reports, things of that nature. Um, I've never experienced any crime at the community. Um, just so you know, from an internal perspective, our company is required to submit an incident report that goes to our legal and insurance teams every time an incident is reported to our office or we are a part of said incident. Um, again, there's nothing in the lease that requires that tenants report. Anytime they call in a call or anything of that nature, they're not required to, but if we're ever exposed to any type of crime or slip and fall or anything of that nature, we report that internally and that's stored. Um, that data is stored. So when we do have conversations about utilizing security or if it's a need, we can reference back to those reports as well too. And again, I've been the regional manager since the entire time we have owned this community um, and been to the site more times than I can probably count. Um, I can confirm that we've never had any issue with crime at this community. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. And, and Mr. Mr. Judge, our, our, it's not our intention to be misleading um, about anything that we've reported. Um, as Rachel mentioned, sometimes there's a disconnect between the, the, the reason or the police and what actually gets reported internally in our systems. Uh, oftentimes, police will respond without uh, on-site staff knowing. Um, and so that takes into account those issues. But uh, I guess overall, you know, we want, we're incentivized and we want to provide a safe environment to our tenants. Um, but based off the data that we're looking at, um, we don't feel like the security guard is, is going to mitigate some of these issues. Um, now, I'll, I'll also caveat that with, look, crime is going to happen anywhere. And so um, no matter if you're here in this community or any community uh, throughout the United States, no matter the demographics, crimes is going to happen. And so yeah. um, I don't think, you know, we're not going to get these calls down to zero. Um, but based off the data, we don't feel like it's going to move the needle in a meaningful way. So that's, that's kind of our um, thought process here. And again, we're not trying to be misleading at all. Um, the data is the data, and sometimes there's a disconnect between the police data and our internal property management data. Thank you for your um, your view on this. Number one, um, uh, there are a lot of these that I think are are not um, life and death responses on the part of the police, and maybe a security guard would or would not um, on the weekends when you don't have you don't have on-site management may not make a difference on some of these other ones they would um and i just for example i think if there's noise complaint having a, a security guard to handle that maybe to, to not have the police have to come out and handle it ahead of time if there is a medical emergency making sure that there's um that the security guard is there to guide the police to where they have to go to be of help um, and fact of the matter is the police say that they have found that security guards have had a beneficial effect on the on other um, residential developments you know, in Amherst uh, is, is an informative and I think a uh, um, something that we should inform that as a board we should inform ourselves with. I am 
interested though that now you have you do have an, you did have data and we and that you have stored and you have reports and all of that wasn't um, wasn't delivered to us um, when we first looked at this and that continues to trouble me and I don't think it's a case of I don't think it's a case of um, we don't understand each other. I think you used your judgment as to you, you, the firm, used your judgment as to what we think that what you thought was important was what we thought was important. And we really need to have that raw data. Um, mm -hmm. That helps us make a decision. And so for that, I'll let the rest of the board deal with it, um, have, have their own opinion on this. But my opinion is that there's a significant, there's just no way that there wouldn't have been um, information to your management company that the police had been there 200 times in the last 18 months and we and represent to us that there's been no problem two weeks ago that's my bottom line um and i would leave it there before, um see if anybody else has a comment this is miss uh this is rachel again i almost said miss window sorry i just wanted to make a clarification when i say we store the reports internally i meant in a general sense there is not a single report for this community i can have our lawyer email it me directly to confirm um but i just meant generally because i have 20 sites in new england so that that was more yep. of a generalization i apologize miss marshall yeah um so it seems it seems like it would be desirable whether there is a security guard or not desirable for management to know about calls to the police. So um, I wonder if the management could collect reports from the police on a monthly basis. However, I don't know how much detail they'd be willing to give you, even though you're the landlords there might be privacy um laws that would mean you you wouldn't know who who was the, the noisy person or causing the disturbance or the fight so um i'm i'm not sure um you know because you've said you try that you can evict people for bad behavior so if you don't know who the bad <laughs> who's behaving badly, you can't really can't do anything about it. So that's one thought. But second of all, I, I just like more clarity from anybody about how a security guard, how that job, what it would look like in this kind of situation. I mean, it's not a gated community. There's no, you know, somebody who can monitor people going in and out and, you know, it's very open. So, what would that person be doing? Walking around constantly? I mean, I, I, I just want, I think we need to define some terms or what each person is thinking is meant by security guard and the kinds of services and powers that person would have. Was that a question for the applicant or for the board to discuss? So Mr. White, I'll take that. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not as I'm I am not a security guard um, expert, but I know that I know two things, Ms. Marshall. The first thing is that the um, the police have said that it is a, a help in reducing problems in other places, and they've used it before. Um, and that's the reason that, and, and they've seen benefit from it. And I think the reason they see benefit from that is that people are, you do have some, you typically will have a security guard move around the, the property. If he is aware of noise, is he, is he aware of, of a break in? Is he of sees um, strange vehicles around at night? Is there something, that's what, that's what a security guard does. He also makes sure that, you know, at night, and during the weekends, when they don't have anybody up on on staff, if there if a problem does arise, that there's somebody that the residents can report to, if there's a problem that does arise, and they don't have people on staff at nights and on um, on Sundays, so that's there's another function that they have, and it's, sometimes it's just having you know as part of a whole security package, whether you do lights, whether you do cameras, whether you do security guards, they all add to the the health and and the safety of the area. Now. 
that's the reason that the one of the reasons that there was a one year trial period and a report back to see how valuable it was was included is that we just we didn't know we'd heard from other people that it had worked so in in the past that was the reason for the um the one year trial period so um, i can't tell you exactly what the hourly duties are i can't tell you what the hourly duties of the security guard are but i can tell you that we think that they pro provide additional security and additional information and safety and we're willing to to take a look at it and have, see a, a year's trial that's what the the thought was for the board uh, last year mr maxfield thank you mr chair um I mean, yeah, I've I've done I've worked as a security guard many years ago, and uh, your job really isn't to uh, you know even prevent crime necessarily. Uh, it's really more to prevent nuisances more than anything else. And if we're looking at the the public comment we received from Mr. Setterfield, that's really something that security should be handling, and there yeah. should be a security guard responding to that. That shouldn't be the police getting called for noise at uh, an establishment of this size, there should be a security guard where one of their primary responsibilities would be ensuring that there isn't loud noise on the property like that, that would be disturbing neighbors. Um, I mean, even just to make the findings that this is harmonious with the the neighborhood in which it is set. And I, I think there's, I think there is a requirement for a security guard to be there with one of their distinct duties being to enforce uh, that there isn't loud noises uh, coming from people's cars or the parking lots or those sorts of things. Um, I, I personally would like to see a security guard on this. I think a project of this size certainly warrants one. Any other Hi. comments from board members? Ms. Pollock. Oh, I just uh, thank you, Dylan, for mentioning the public comment. Um, submitted. Uh, I, perhaps we forgot to uh, list that in the. Um, well, I thought I did. I, I can't recall. I think I mentioned it, but if oh, not, okay. it's good. It was good to catch. Yeah, if I didn't mention it, thank you, Dylan. I also mentioned okay. possibly collecting police reports. You know, so that management knows. I don't know if that's possible or informative. So one of the things that we do require um, routinely, Ms. Marshall, is reports on uh, disturbances or um, that where management feels that the um, activity is um, could lead to eviction, breaks the, breaks the lease, those kinds of things. So those reports are already that the tenant, the, the management has to compile those on an annual basis and has to provide those to the town. So that's not sort of crime reports for you know breaking and entering a, uh, or br breaking a window in a car, but that's for noise and other kinds of things that would cause um, either punishment or eventually evictions that could break the lease. So there's some of that reporting already, but there's not police reporting at this time that I know of. And I'm not sure that the police are, are gathering this information. This was, you know, they had to do this separately and, and compile this report for us because uh, they don't compile this and publish it anymore. Okay, are there any other questions for Mr. White or Ms. Window or um, Mr. O'Sullivan from members of the board? If not, um, what I think we need to do then is, since we have some new information, we should open it up to the public to get public comments. But, well, I guess before we do that, Mr. White, I want to give you a chance if you want to to um, deal with any of the issues we haven't dealt with before. If there's other things you want to say before we open up to public comment. We did have additional submissions, so I think the public comment period is appropriate. But we, that's normally after you've made any kind of presentation. I think we've gone through your your uh, responses to our requests. I don't know if there's right. anything else you need to say. Um, I think I, I I just wanted to respond to the last conversation uh, and comments from uh, from the board members about uh, about the need for a security guard. Um, <clears throat> I think and I agree with with Mr. Maxfield in terms with this comment about the use of a security guard. Um, 
is more for public nuisance prevention and mitigation. Um, I think that's, you know, our, our staff hours are, you know, Monday to Friday, 9 to 6 p.m. And, you know, Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So we do have staff on site Monday to, to Saturday, um, at least at some portion of the day. Um, but we, you know, we would be, you know, if the, if the board feels like a security guard is, is necessary, uh, we'd be willing to agree to a weekend security guard uh, with, you know, to cover up that gap of, of timing when there isn't anyone on site. Uh, to prevent some of these issues from happening and mitigating some of these noise complaints. Um, but we would propose, as, as was mentioned before, uh, a review period after the security has been on site um, after six months uh, to, to gauge whether or not this is something that's been uh, a benefit to, uh, to the property. You know, I think that's something that's reasonable. It is a significant expense that we would have to to um, make in order to hire the security guard. And so we would appreciate the availability to do some sort of review um, to see if, if, that, if, if that security guard is something that needs to continue or not. Any other, com any other comments from uh, your side, Mr. White? I think that's all not, I have. Rachel, all over. Rachel, is there anything? I'll open up to public comments if there's anybody from the public that wishes to speak, please raise your hand. I Maureen, I don't see that there's any public commenters on this matter. Okay. All right. So what I'd like to do is um, we be last week, we began the pro. Yes, Maureen, what were you going to say? Uh, uh, Craig Meadows has raised his hand. Oh, Mr. Meadows. I, I, I am glad Sarah took up the EV charging line. Thank you. Uh, I did look up the regulations. It, it does say that if there are five or fewer um, EV char charging stations per uh, site, that um, a site being an address that uh, there is a handicapped accessible one required and that handicapped accessible re uh, charging station shall be 16 feet wide. Okay. Point of, I'm not certain if that has anything to do with the deliberations you're doing, but since I have not been listening to all of it, but if that's helpful, I... that's the Thank you, Mr. Meadows. It goes back to the need for the, the plans to reflect what is required by state law or by state regulation and, and local regulation. Okay, um, if there's no other comments, uh, what we last week we proceeded to um, go through a number of the conditions that uh, we, uh, we we approved a number of conditions or several that we didn't. Uh, we needed more information. Um, I guess that what my, we have two possibilities here for this application and we have another one yet tonight. Uh, two possibilities. We can go through uh, the conditions, uh, all the conditions that we hadn't dealt with before, uh, decide on them and then go and make our determinations and make our findings uh, on this project. I suspect that's going to take us the hour to do that um, or close to it. And then we would have to um, continue the second, probably have to continue the second um, application we have before us until later on. Or we can, um, we can decide to wait for the information regarding the um, that the applicant is going to give back to us, which is the information on the number of children, uh, some st snow storage information. Um, we can proceed through much of this, spend a half hour on some of the conditions and come back in a week or in two weeks and finalize it at that time if, we'll, if we wish. But the question, it's kind of up to the board. If you're ready to act on this one, 
knowing that we may not have enough time to finish up with the Loomis application, that's fine too. We can act on this or we can wait and wait for more information if we, if the board feels they need it. So I look to the sort of the, the feeling of the board, if, whether they want to go on with this or whether we should uh, continue this for two weeks. Is there anybody who wishes to continue it for two weeks? Uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Ma yep, Mr. Maxfield. Um, my feeling would probably be we still need to take public comment on this, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I would probably say my feeling is is wait the the two weeks to get that information and then just move through it on there. Uh, that's that's me personally. Yep. Anybody else? Can I just say I think it's in fact three weeks till the next meeting. Just yeah. What's the date on the next meeting morning? And I want to make, I believe it would be October the 13th and okay. uh, Sarah, who's on this is impaneled on this case uh, may not be available on that particular date. -ish, um, well, but... I wouldn't say that. I mean, oh. I'm supposed to get back on the 11th. Oh, okay. It's just that I won't have a lot of time to prepare. That's all. But, um... but I would say that it seems that we're, you know, making a lot of headway here. So perhaps mm -hmm. there wouldn't be a lot of um, review on your behalf, Sarah. Uh, but, you yeah. Know, so maybe that would be fine. Okay. Yeah. I, I, it doesn't seem like there will be very much new information. Okay. So listen, what I'd like to do is I, I, I think that we, um, we have a lot of work left on this in terms of going through findings and we have information we want to get from the applicant. Um, I would move that we continue this uh, application to October 13th at six o'clock. Uh, and at that point, we'll take up the, um, the application, the special permit application. We'll do conditions, we'll do findings, we'll review what we get from the, um, from the applicant we may have, uh, we may need to get further information uh, regarding the, uh, the police presence and maybe we can get some more information on what they feel is the value of a security guard and how, what their experience has been in other, other locations and answered some of the questions that both were raised by the applicant as well as by other members. Um, do I have a motion to do that, to continue it to the, the 13th? Uh, Mr. Maxfield? Chair. But yep. before we make that motion, do we not want to do public comment uh, tonight? Oh, we did. Uh, nobody signed up for it. We, oh. Yep. We, uh, we call, I think I did call for public yeah. comment, didn't I, Maurice? Yep, I did. Uh, yeah, I believe yep. you did. But, oh, and nobody know. commented. Yep. Must have missed exactly. that. In that case, I will, <laughs> I will go ahead and make that motion. All right. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Ms. Park seconds it. Is there a discussion on the motion? If not, uh, before you um, finalize that, uh, does the applicant, uh, you know, um, the applicant, I believe, need, needs to make the request to continue the public hearing? Is Are they agreeable to continue to, uh, I was going to say March, until October 13th? Um, the meeting would start at 6 via Zoom? Yes, we can agree to do that. All right. Any other, any discussion on the motion? This is a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. It's five ayes, no nays. Motion carries. Uh, we'll see you guys again in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not impaneled on the next application, so I will say goodbye. Right. Thanks for your work today. Yeah. All right. So long, everyone. Yeah. The next order of business, uh, before we start, it's 8 o'clock. We have started a tradition of a three-minute break around 8. Would people like that? Quick bathroom break? Quick. Yep. All right. Be back in three minutes.
All right, I'm back. I'm just going to have my camera turned off while I eat this soup that I just made. <laughs> totally I understandable. <laughs> I was just eating peanut m and M. Oh, so I can, I can see your, your soup, Dylan. And, and you're eating peanut m and M's, and I'm drinking water. So <laughs> the, the dinner is getting cold. Uh, Ms. Parks, Tammy, you have some. The next order of business is ZBA FY 2023-06, Loomis Communities, Inc. Requests a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit ZBA FY 1985-04, ZBA FY 1988-45, and ZBA FY 1990-8 for the expansion of an existing planned residential unit, a PERD, with the proposed construction of, a th th of three building additions including a pool pavilion, meeting room, enclosed atrium, and a three-story residential addition with nine new family multifamily dwellings and for amending conditions six, nine, and 10 under ZBA FY 1990-8 under Article 7 and Section 4.4, 10.33, and 10.38 of the Zoning Bylaw. Located at Applewood, 1 Spencer Drive, 
Map 25A, Parcel 43, Outlying Residence District, and PERD Overlay Zoning District. Members sitting for this panel include myself, Ms. Parks, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Gilbert, and Mr. Maxfield. Um, we conducted a site visit on Tuesday. Was it, yeah, was it yesterday? Tuesday, I think it was. Um, and we met at the site, met with the architect and the management at the site. We uh, observed where the new residential building was going to be constructed, how close it was to the sidewalk, how um, looked at drawings of what the uh, out exterior would look like and how it would um, conform with the extent to which it conforms with the existing building. We went to the front to see where the new atrium and winter garden area is going to be, where it's going to, how it's going to affect a portion of the parking lot uh, and some of the plantings. We walked inside the the um, building to see the, the current um, meeting space, walked out to where the pool pavilion was, was going to be and how that was going to be changed and got a, a sense for the size and um, and heft of the of the of the uh, the pool building, the pool addition. Um, we had some discussion about the need for an ad additional meeting space. We had some discussion about parking and the number of parking places which are needed on a daily basis, which they feel are needed on a daily basis and are utilized on a daily basis. Um, and we had discussions about public transportation and other ways that people uh, get around without having to use a car uh, at Applewood um, and without, ha without having to use their own car at Applewood. Um, and we looked at the green space around the area. I think that pretty much sums up the site visit. I don't know that there's much else we have to report on. Uh, I think that's, that's it. Um, so who's going to, who's going to present for the applicant, please identify yourself and uh, give your address for the record. Great. So my name is Jeff Squire. I'm a principal at the Berkshire Design Group here on behalf of Applewood and Loomis Communities. Um, here with me tonight is Marge Mantoni, the executive, um, the CEO of Applewood. Um, uh, I, I believe Lou is also here and uh, Richard Sullivan uh, from Big and Wilson is also here tonight. Um, and I believe we also have some representatives from the architects um, uh, that are here as well. So um, yeah, I can take you through a quick presentation yep. um, if that would be appropriate at this time. That'd be helpful. Run Great. us through what your your build your plans are. Show us the site plans and um, give us a, give us an overview, please. Absolutely. So um, so yeah, thank you uh, thank you for for joining us tonight. Um, we are um, this is a relatively small project in scope of uh, the the entire property. Um, just to give you a general overview, um, the the property is at the corner of West Bay Road, which runs across the top of the page here, and then and Rambling Road, which um, is on the right side of the page here. Atkins and that open uh, parcel for development is to the right. Uh, the Eric Carl Museum is directly across the street um, at Hampshire College um, on the north side of West Bay Road. Um, the facility consists of a large, uh, large sort of sprawling building um, on the site. There are uh, Spencer, uh, Spencer Drive circulates the, the facility in the back, which is a private drive. It enters and exits onto West Bay Road and also at, at Rambling Road. Um, there's a number of parking lots that are accessed um, off, of, off, of, um, off of Spencer Drive that include a um, number of garages and, and maintenance facilities. Uh, but generally all of the access in and out of uh, the property, at least for the residents, is via Spencer Drive, um, which comes in off the site, um, off the adjacent roads. The, um, again, this was submitted as part of the application package, but these are just a few images of some of the areas of the existing site um, where work is proposed. So this is that main entrance off of Spencer Drive where that loop drive is. Um, the loop drive can be seen um, sort of down here on the bottom. It, it enters in and around. Um, and speaking to the uh, residential uh, addition component is really off the, the wing of this building here that you can see on the right side of the page. But this is a, these are views of that, um, of where that, uh, that work will, will occur. 
Um, and so I think, uh, and I apologize, I, I would like to have Marge uh, Mantoni from Applewood sort of introduce the project, um, Applewood in general, and um, really what, what they hope to achieve with this project. Um, I should have done it at the beginning of this, but it was excited to, to jump in and <laughs> get, get on with the conversation. So um, I'd, I'll introduce Marge, please, just to, to introduce the project and Applewood um, as an interruption here. So yeah, Marge. So, Mr. Squire and Marge, I do not want to interrupt it even more, but I failed to, because I was excited as well, I guess. We were both excited. <laughs> I, was ex I failed to list the submissions, and so I'd like to do that now so that we're not doing it after the, uh, after the presentation, um, yep. and so we can get it, get it out of the way. Um, so, applicant submissions include um, a special permit application, and um, a mem two memos regarding the application. Regarding the expansion dated August 11th and September 2nd, applicant response to section 10.38 specific findings, your management plan, lighting cut sheets, a site plan prepared by Berkshire Design Group that includes one, two, three, four, five um, plans, including an illustrative layout and a landscape plan, a building plan set, which includes two, four, six, eight, ten um, renderings including a bird's eye view, uh, proposed common expansion, et cetera. Then we have staff submissions, which include a project application report dated September 19th, ZBA special permit decisions of 1988, 85, 88, and 1990, a PERD boundary map, a PERD aerial map, GIS generated maps of the property, a zoning map, an aerial map, a topography map, and a conservation of trails map. In addition, there was a drawing dated 921 uh, from email by Matt Hughes, um, which regards the roof line calculations. I think that's all the submissions that we've received. And I again apologize for interrupting your your presentation and Marge for uh, delaying you. But uh, I, I just have to do that before we go any further. No, oh, no, that's great. Thank you so much. And I'm going to be real quick. You guys have already had a very long night. Um, just on behalf of of the Applewood community. Really want to thank you for um, you know entertaining our proposal tonight. Um, just a little background: Applewood is a not-for-profit community um, who opened its doors in 1991, um, providing 103 independent living apartments for um, people over the age of 62. Um, so Applewood has been home to hundreds and maybe even thousand a thousand people um, in Amherst over the last 30 plus years. The project that Jeff is going to go over with you um, will enable Applewood to continue to not only serve residents of today, but those into the future. Um, and the, um, the new amenities will be um, really welcome additions for the residents. And the new apartments, the nine new apartments that are proposed, will allow enable us to move some of the people. We um, take a waiting list for people who want to live at Applewood. There are currently well over 120 parties waiting to live at Applewood. And so nine doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it's, a, it's a help. And um, it will en enable us to serve more people um, now and into the future. So, um, you know, it's a real great, the amenities are a great opportunity for our residents to gather, to learn, to stay well. And the apartments will enable us to continue to fulfill our not-for-profit mission to serve um, to open doors to positive aging. So thank you for seeing us tonight. And I'm going to stop talking and shift it back to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Marge. Um, and sorry for that. So um, yeah, just to get right back to it, um, our, the proposal um, and project consists of three, uh, three additions um, throughout the property. Um, all associated with the with the larger building, um, the larger main building. Um, at the main entrance, there is a new uh, new meeting space, new meeting room, um, and an, uh, a, a four season sort of atrium space as an entryway that includes a covered walkway. Um, really, a, 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 a more inviting entrance to the to the site and and um, uh, uh, spaces that offer some opportunities for the residents to to do some things and and. Um, uh, attend events that they may not have the opportunity to do now. Above this uh, portion of the addition, there are three units, uh, three new residential units that are proposed. Um, 
the parking lots on the site will will mostly be maintained in their existing um, uh, existing layout. There are some small modifications to this to this central loop here, this drop off um, to facilitate this uh, addition, which bumps out a little bit into the into the drive aisle. Now we are losing two parking spaces in this location to ensure that we have adequate access and vehicle circulation, um, much as it is now. Uh, but otherwise, there's no no other change to the site other than just reconnecting walks and, and entryways and exits out of the uh, out of the building into the courtyard. Uh, landscaping will, re will be replaced. There's a uh, you know a valuable patio space at this um, you know at the entryway that will be preserved with its southern exposure and and offers a nice um, uh, a nice amenity to to the residents. So that will be recreated. Um, so that's one portion of the of the project. Another is this three story addition off of this wing of the uh, westernmost uh, portion of the building. So as again, in, in those images, this is really just to replicate sort of the existing condition and the architects can speak to this more, but this really just um, uh, locates a three story addition that would match the existing uh, facility in what is currently green space now. There are some retaining walls and some landscaping there now that will be replaced um, in the proposed condition. And then lastly, there's a one story pool pavilion um, that uh, occupies what is now a uh, uh, sort of an outdoor patio space um, in the northern corner of the building. Um, again, just taking you through some of the site plans and the uh, site requirements, um, all of the setbacks, um, lot areas, uh, frontages, most of those are all, you know, either being exceeded or, or met minimally. Um, there's a number because of the PERD overlay district that don't necessarily apply, uh, particularly with building coverage and lot coverage, um, number of floors. Uh, we, we will speak about a building height uh, uh, a little bit later, I'm sure. Um, the, the building height now is not going to, or the proposed building height is not going to exceed, oops, I'm sorry here, uh, exceed the current building height. Um, and given where it's measured from, um, it is a pre-existing non-conforming condition, but we can speak to that later. Um, and then lastly, with regards to parking, I'm just gonna back up a sheet. Um, as I mentioned, we are losing two spaces here. And uh, in, in one of the subsequent memos that um, was referenced with regards to parking, we are seeking um, as part of this application, a waiver from section 7.9 which for this use requires uh, one space per bedroom. Um, Mars noted there were 103 units. I believe there's 177 bedrooms total. Um, and these, these include two bedroom units. They include studios and single, uh, single uh, unit apartments. So it's a range of, 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 uh, of uh, unit sizes in terms of bedroom counts. Um, this would require 195 bedroom or 100, there's 195 beds, I guess, as a result of, of this requirement, 195 spaces. Um, there are currently 161 spaces uh, available on the site. And these are open space, uh, open parking lot spaces, as well as the garage spaces. There are a number of garage spaces um, on, the, on the site, as you, um, as we indicated before, there's a number in the Western portion of the site. Um, that, that, that uh, added all up include 161 spaces. We are losing two, as I noted. So there, are, there will be 159 total spaces provided on the site. Um, currently, they have a need for 75, uh, 74 uh, parking spaces at 98% capacity. So um, of, the, of all the units that are there at 98% capacity, there's only about three quarters uh, or less than three quarters of the spaces that are being utilized by, by residents. There are roughly 29 staff spaces um, at, at maximum shift change that would be required. So um, there's roughly about a hundred, a little over a hundred spaces that are needed um, at the current moment. There's no spaces that are designated other than accessible spaces. Um, so based on their experience over the years since, um, since the facility was built, they haven't, um, they haven't experienced any parking issues or parking shortages. Um, there is ample parking along Spencer Drive 
which is a private drive in the event of, um, you know, the need for overflow events um, or parking. Um, but based on, you know, again, their experience, there, there just isn't a need for, you know, the 200 or so spaces that are required by zoning. So we are seeking uh, a waiver under that section. Um, I think there, there are no changes to, um, to site lighting, to, um, to signage other than just, you know, relocating some of the directional signage that may result of, as a result of this turnaround modification um, or loop drop off modifications, but um, all of that work is going to be pretty minimal. Um, no new utility work. Um, site lighting uh, was submitted. There will be some downcast site lighting um, or wall packs at the various exits and egress, um, egress locations. Again, the architects can speak to those locations, but those will all be, um, you know, dark sky compliant and downlit um, as required. Uh, again, just running through the submission application package, a more detailed plan showing grading and, and some of the specific site details um, relative to patios and hardscapes. Uh, planting plan um, indicating a number of species and plants being relocated and added um, as part of the project. And um, again, I think this is an opportunity to turn it over to the architects and that can run through um, the various uh, building elevations and, uh, and images. So Matt or Taki with that, I will turn it over to you and I can continue to flip through these slides if that works. Uh, Matt, is it Matt, Matthew? Yes. You said, oh, I, um, hold on Matthew, I need to make you a panelist. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, he's coming over. Mr. Hughes? Yes, hi there. Hi. Uh, so, so please identify yourself for the record. Yes, Matthew and Hughes. Name and address. Uh, Matthew Hughes, address 389 Elliott Street, Newton, Upper Falls. Thank you, go ahead. Uh, to walk you through uh, some of the renderings, plans, and elevations. Uh, first off, we have the new Commons expansion. Uh, which consists of a two-story building, approximately 10,500 square feet uh, between the two floors. Um, on the lower, on the entry level, uh, there is a large auditorium slash meeting space, uh, a uh, enclosed winter garden with a uh, winter cafe, uh, consisting of a small service warm-up kitchen uh, type space. Uh, to provide grab and go food for residents. Um, that's enclosed in a uh, capped with a skylight and uh, some uh, curtain wall uh, along the entry walkway, uh, covered entry walkway. Uh, and then on the upper level, there are three new residential independent living units, um, and, uh, ranging in various sizes. And uh, those also connect to the existing upper level as well via an elevated walkway, um, uh, an enclosed elevated walkway uh, separating the two spaces. Um, and uh, that connects into the existing building. So this is the uh, floor plan uh, with the circulation highlighted in yellow. Uh, and the lighter color being the existing building, the orange being the uh, proposed, um, and it shows how the circulation is now uh, entering the new uh, proposed expansion. Um, there's gonna be a covered patio uh, on the lower level or entry level as well, uh, located in the rear um, with the uh, one of the apartments located above. Um, and here you can see, correct, yes. And uh, here you can see the uh, general layout of the proposed auditorium meeting room space that can be divided as needed, uh, ample storage, egress stair, uh, winter garden space as well with the, the small service kitchen. And um, above, 
there's also the, the three units with uh, three balconies as well, connecting into the existing uh, existing building. Okay. Uh, here is the updated elevation, um, which we could talk about the uh, average grade plane now, if you'd like. Um, we uh, thank you to Maureen and uh, Commissioner Ro uh, Rob for providing some guidance as far as calculating the uh, existing average grade plane uh, relative to the uh, Bay Road and uh, Rambling Road. Uh, so we've established those on the elevation and provided two dimensions to both. Uh, one to the existing building, uh, noting the midpoint of the sloped roof and then one to the highest point of the proposed uh, midpoint of the slope roof as well. Noting that, uh, as uh, Jeff mentioned uh, leading into this, that the uh, existing building is, is out of compliance with the 35 feet, uh, but we are not exceeding that current condition with the proposed uh, new building. Uh, so that's noted here for the commons expansion portion. I've just one question. What's the existing height? What's the, the far left number there? I can't read it. Uh, 38, seven and three quarters. And the, and the proposed is 38, five and a half. OK, thank you. And that's at least from uh, Bay Road on the other side right. of the elevation is rambling, which uh, notes very similar. Uh, next uh, portion of the project is the uh, three-story apartment tower unit, um, which consists of six independent living unit apartments, approximately uh, 2,500 square feet, uh, square feet per floor, uh, totaling about uh, 7,500. And um, uh, the uh, objective for us is to uh, create an extension of what their current uh, wing looks like. And so it seems seamless and uh, is to be a, um, an extension of what they currently have. Uh, so really from a floor plan perspective, it's very minimal to what we are adding other than pure units with a small extension of corridor to lead and to feed into those uh, two units on each floor. Uh, and here on the elevation as well, uh, noting the two uh, average grade planes, um, and then the proposed uh, as it's relative to both grade planes. Noting that we're not exceeding uh, the existing conditions. Okay. And lastly is the uh, pool pavilion, uh, which uh, is a one story lo located on the lowest level of Applewood. Um, as uh, on this side of the building, the grade slopes down uh, to become three stories. Uh, it is about 1,200 square feet uh, of an addition with some programmatic and uh, improvements uh, to the interior spaces of the existing building as well um, to help uh, benefit the owner and the residents. Uh, here's the lower level floor plan indicating where the uh, proposed addition will be located. Um, and uh, the addition primarily consists of slab on grade with a uh, recessed resistance pool, prefabricated pre resistance pool um, that's just located into place. And um, it would allow uh, a exercise alternative for residents um, and uh, prov uh, provides uh, rehabilitation alternatives as well uh, using the resistance or um, treadmill accessories. Elevation as well, uh, no no noting the uh, two average grade, grade planes on both sides and showing that we are well below what the, what the existing building is. And the pool pavilion is also capped by a uh, small skylight as well. Okay. So I don't think I have um, any other 
um, any other points to present at this time, but happy to answer any questions or um, entertain any comments that the board may have at this time. Members of the board, Mr. Meadows. Oh, you're muted, Mr. Meadows. As, as I mentioned at the site visit, uh, I'd be interested in where you're gonna put the EV parking um, to meet the requirement. Um, and I did also mention that there's up to $50,000 per uh, street address for EV uh, grants from the Department of, from Mass DEP. Uh, there's a requirement that if you have less, fewer than five uh, EV stations at a site that one of them has to be designated as handicapped and is 16 feet wide. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any idea where you're going to put that? Um, I don't immediately, just based on, you know, all this information was relatively new. We did get um, that rebate information passed along um, to, to Marge and Applewood, um, you know, quickly. So I know that is going to be something they are going to pursue because as noted during the site visit, um, that is something that has been in the capital budget uh, for Apple for a number of years because of the increased demand for uh, for EV charging units. So this will certainly uh, be a catalyst to, uh, um, to to produce some of those results. So I don't know. You know, we'll we'll have to do a little bit of research in terms of um, you know electrical um, uh, availability on the site and how that would affect some of the existing parking. But I know it will become part of um, a part of this plan going forward. So um, I don't know whether Marge or Lou, anybody else can say anything more about it, but I imagine it will be where, um, you know, where it would be mo certainly most useful to the residents. Yeah, we, um, you know, th and, and thank you, Mr. Meadows for that information. We were really excited to hear about the, the rebate program and started looking into it right away. So um, as Jeff said, we um, got the name of a of a, of a one company at least that um, I reached out to somebody else in Eastern Mass who had just added an EV station, an EV charging station, and um, so she gave me the name of the contractor that they worked with. Um, but that was yesterday, so or just this morning she responded. So as soon as we have the information, we can certainly update the plan. But um, would be um, definitely. Um, looking to do that. So you'd be um, you'd be amenable to having a requirement that you you put in in your final drawings that you submit to the town of the placement of the EV um, uh, places EV uh, uh, parking spaces, right? Yes. Good. Okay. We can make sure that that's one of the conditions, Mr. Meadows. Thank you. Other questions from the board? I had a I had a question that's not really um, that's not about the outdoor layout, but about the layout of the of the uh, pool. How how big is it? It looks like it's about fifteen by fifteen or something like like that. It's hard to tell from the from the floor plan. So it's just really a it's sort of a, it's not a lap pool. It's a, a swimming in plate, whatever they call those swimming in place pools. With, a, where you, where you swim against a, a current. Is that what you're talking about here? Correct. Correct. Uh, this model that we've been uh, pursuing has uh, two motors uh, for two quote unquote lanes um, in, a, in the resistance pool. Um, uh, the pool itself is about 16 by 16 feet. Okay. And, um, the the whole addition itself is is fairly small. And so Com and you Com mentioned this, it, it can be used a lot for uh, rehabilitation and and um, for that popular for that population that might be really good. Makes a lot of sense. Any other questions from board members?
Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I'd like to just maybe raise a point about the parking here. Um, I, you know, I appreciate the applicant here you know, kind of walking through the, well, actually the architect for that now, walking through the layout of the building. Um, you know, I'm just looking at the numbers here. I understand that, you know, with what's currently provided versus what's required, you know, of course, by zoning, by right, um, I think we're currently at like 91% of the requirement. We're suggesting that we're going to add units, of course, um, and decrease the parking um, by, I think it's uh, two spaces here. So, you know, by my math, that looks like 82% of the required numbers. Now, normally, I mean, that would be, you know, uh, item of concern, but given, given the use, um, you know, of this as sort of an aging in place facility, I'm a little less concerned. You know, it, it sounds like the current numbers that are provided are adequate. I think the number mentioned was 98% utility right now. Um, for resident parking, my concern, of course, is if if we're adding more units to, you know, the existing um, number here, we're going to, you know, require more parking. So can you explain perhaps how the uh, excess parking right now is, is being utilized? Is that being utilized primarily by staff of which there's not a requirement for, or, you know, are those sitting vacant? Ben and Marge could certainly speak to this better, but I know there are a number of spaces that certainly sit vacant. Um, you know, again, there's there are no assigned spaces other than the garage spaces. Um, so any of the open air spaces that aren't taken up by you know resident vehicles or by staff um, just remain vacant. And there are you know frequently a number of vacant spaces you know throughout the site. Um, I know that, um, yeah, I mean, one of the appeals of this facility is, you know, that they offer both, both um, you know, van and car uh, services as part of the, um, of, of part of the um, functions of the, of the facility, in addition to, you know, the PVTA stop across the street. So there are a number of residents that, you know, don't even um, need vehicles just because they, you know, they can depend on uh, the, the transportation that's provided there. So, um, there, there are frequently a, a number of vacant spaces there and the nine additional units, um, you know, we don't or they don't anticipate that there'll be a huge change in the demand for vehicles, resident vehicles anyway. Um, the project is adding one, um, I think either full or part-time staff, um, but, that's, but that's it. It's, you know, the staffing, um, the staffing need upgrades with this proposal are minimal. Um, it's really just the nine additional uh, residential units, which again, at you know, a 98% capacity, um, you know, they're at less than three quarters, um, you know, um, three quarters full for, uh, you know, for, for vehicles associated with those, with those individual units. You covered it well, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for that overview. Um, you know, maybe just a follow up question. Has there ever been historically any issue with, um, you know, parking needs on site not being met by by what's provided? Of course, you know, right now, it sounds like it's not an issue, but you know, historically, has there been? Any, yeah, any I don't think so. And, and so and just to point out too that there's an arboretum across the street that, you know, is frequented by the public. Um, and so Spencer, it's not uncommon for Spencer Drive to serve as overflow parking. It's, it's a full 24, 26 foot wide roadway. Um, so there's more than ample space for on-street parking all along Spencer Drive where possible um, in, those, you know, in those events where you know, there happened to be a, a, you know, a need for overflow parking. But um, you know, my understanding is that those are, are, are rare and far between. Um, Correct. But there are there is room on site and, you know, and all this service space down here also could function as overflow parking if it really comes down to it. But I just I don't think there's been a, a, a demand for that or a need for that um, that they've seen. Thanks for the explanation. Um, not sure if anyone else you know, on the board has any comments or, or questions about that, but that you know, sort of satisfies it for me. It's one of the ways that point since, you know, we're substantially under, but at the same time. It, it does seem as though um, you know it's kind of uh, accommodated based on based on the usage of the, of the building. 
Miss Parks. I was just going to say the um, the new meeting um, space will that be open to the public? Um, in other words, I'm thinking of if there's an event there, then where would parking occur? We, we don't have any plans at this point for it to be just open to the public, um, but we could invite groups in for, you know, for, for if there was a meeting. I mean, we do, we currently host, um, you know, um, you know, continuous learning programs and things of that nature. And, and even with that, we don't have any, any issue with the parking and so forth, because as Jeff pointed out, um, you know, if we needed it, people can park along Spencer Drive. Um, so we don't expect to have, you know, at this point, our plan is not to have, you know, um, you know, graduations or, or, you know, large functions in, in the, um, in the space. It, it's primarily set to be used for residents um, and then guests or, or, you know, some people, but it's not, it's not going to be rented out space, so to speak, for a recital or something of that nature. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking more of like the League of Women Voters or something like that, if a group wanted to uh, mm -hmm. meet in that space. And, and we currently do offer those opportunities and have not run into any parking issues. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from the board? I guess I would, I, the only question I have really is, um, is perhaps Mr. Mora can help. Um, it looks to me like the roof line is, um, while it's above the zoning bylaw limit of 35 feet, it is below or almost the same, if not a little bit below the existing conditions and existing non-conforming roof line. And Mr. Mora, can you, is, is that correct? I mean, in, from a visual standpoint, it looks to me like it meshes well and it doesn't create a, um, a different roof line or a higher roof line. It looks like it, it fits in with the, the, um, prop, the existing property and the existing architecture very well. Um, but is it correct that it's, it is no higher than the existing line and we, we really are looking at is extension of an, a, extension of an existing non-conforming pre-existing condition for this new roof line. Uh, yes, that's that's exactly correct. So the the existing non-conforming uh, roof line exists. Uh, it's been there for uh, a long enough time to gain that status. Uh, the zoning bylaw allows the board to consider extending that. Uh, uh, to a height that's beyond what the, the current bylaw has for a height limitation, but uh, not in greater than what's there as an existing condition. And that's done under section 9.22. So that would be a finding that the board could make to support uh, that addition. Great. Thank you. Other questions from members of the board? Um, if not, and, and if there's no other presentation or information that the applicant wants to relate to the board, I'd open it up for public comment. Um, Maureen, do we have anybody from the, uh, the public that wishes to speak? And if you're a member of the public who wishes to speak on this matter, please raise your, use the raise hand function of Zoom to indicate to us that you wish to speak. I'm not seeing any raised hands. I always give it just a little bit of time for people to find that raised hand function, but it looks like we don't have any anybody seeking recognition. All right. If we don't have any um, public comment, one last chance for the applicant to make any last statements before we move into the um, meeting phase, we keep the, the hearing open in case we need to solicit additional information, but we move into the meeting phase to allow us to consider um, both the 
findings we have to make, but first to consider the conditions that we'd want to impose on the um, on the application in order to be able to make the findings that we're required to make under the zoning bylaw. Yeah, so the on behalf of the applicant, I don't think we have any other further presentation material. All right. Then if barring any interest on the part of board members to speak further, let's start looking at conditions. Um, if we turn to page, I guess it's 17 of the project application report. Uh, the first condition is pretty much uh, standard. Project use shall be built and maintained according to approved plans. This is our standard language. The approved plans, including XYZ, Maureen, we will, of course, have the most the approved plans will be the most recently submitted plans and they'll be up to date, correct? Correct. XYZ is, yeah, you'll figure that out. All rooms to be labeled on the following approved floor plans. Again, we will find these floor plans, I think, either the ones that have been submitted or a more recent one without any substantial change from what we've seen is submitted. The approved management plan shall be followed by the applicant. The building shall be two and a half stories height and heights measured as shown in the approved plan, the finished uh, grades to highest point. Um, uh, Mr. Ch yes. Chair, uh, I guess I would want to clarify those three additions um, of how many stories um, shall be so I guess there's a variety. Do you have the pool pavilion, uh, which is one story, the common expansion? Um, I don't know um, if that would be considered two and a half or three. And then the apartment tower. Well, how do we represent that in a condition? Do we just, are we satisfied that the drawings that they have provided satisfy give us this and then we just reference those drawings and elevations that we've been provided yeah or we could uh, do sort of within this possible condition uh, for um, we could state um, you know the common expansion shall be this amount of stories the pool pavilion shall be one story and the tower shall be three uh, i just I, I i can't recall at this exact moment what those particular build, building additions are but we so i'm comfortable i'm comfortable giving you and rob the flexibility to reflect what we saw in the drawings uh today to, to um identify the, the height of those of the, the number of stories of those buildings so why don't we do why don't we leave it at that unless there's an objection from anybody um, any changes to the management plan and complaint response plan shall return to the zoning board appeals at a public meeting. Property shall be free of litter and debris. Before the issuance of any building permits, the applicant shall obtain sewer, water, driveway, and trench permits from the Amherst Department of Public Works. Building exterior and site improvements, the town engineer shall inspect the construction of entry driveways and on-site paved areas for conformance to town standards. Now we're getting into um, what are the some of the more, again, the more typical construction work uh, conditions. All on-site utilities shall be underground. The applicant should provide an as-built plan to show buildings, locations, grades, access ways, parking ways to the town building commissioner, the town engineer, and to be placed in the special permit in the planning office within 90 days of receiving certificate of occupancy. All exterior lighting shall be designed and installed to be shielded or downcast. Uh, lighting shall be selected according to the dark sky compliance recommendation and the ZBA rules and regs. The building shall meet all local energy efficiency code and regulations of stretch energy code. In addition, low flow plumbing fixtures shall be installed throughout the project. Temporary certificates of occupancy shall be approved through the building commissioner. The building commissioner may impose 30 requirements to guarantee completion of any work required before issuing a temporary occupancy permit, including for landscaping and or the top coat of paving and or other required items that the building commissioner determines may be, may be provided after a temporary occupant permit issues. And the surety provided shall be an appropriate form pursuant to any written surety agreement. With the amount of the surety to be determined following peer review of a punch list provided by the applicant of the work to be secured with the estimated costs and with required surety to be taken into account the cost of the town, the work, prevailing wage and competitive bidding requirements and the impact of inflation. All utility work and work within the public right of way should be conducted following the regulations and permits required by the town of Amherst. Digital CAD plans shall be required for final built 
as built plans for DPW. These plans shall be called property lines, pins, easements, and utilities. The utility information shall include rims, inverts, pipes, size, slopes, all water valves, shutoffs, and water service, service locations, and clean, all clean out locations. The following construction permits and current associated fees shall be required by the DPW prior to the start of construction, Trent permit, sewer entrance permit, and a water system entrance permit, and all other permits that may be required. The final certificate of occupancy should not be issued for any building or any unit until the final to top coat of paving for all driveway and access areas, sidewalks, and berms has been completed. Landscape as shown on the plan of record, on the plan of record has been installed and the complete as-built plans have been submitted the building commissioner and town engineer by all design professionals for the site and the building construction approved by the building commissioner and town engineer. Parking and access. Parking shall occur on improved services only. The parking area shall be maintained as needed. The parking and drive area shall be constructed in accordance with the requirement of Article 7.1. The 159 on-site parking spaces shall be constructed and maintained by the applicant. That's the right number, correct? 159? Okay. The parking management plan shall be followed at all times and any changes to the parking management plan shall be reviewed and approved by the zoning board of commissioners at a public meeting. Landscaping and signage. Landscaping shall be maintained by the property owners in accordance with the management plan. Pro uh, plantings that die have to be replaced. This is a typical um, requirement, a condition that we place. Applicants shall make reasonable efforts to use natural herbicides and non-toxic chemicals for regularly scheduled treatments of landscaping and advance notice and appropriate warnings to tenants from the public shall be provided regarding the application of toxic treatments to any common area used by tenants or the public. All mature trees found in the area shall, except those to be shown on the approved plans to be removed, shall remain and be maintained to provide visual screening from the adjacent properties. Any existing mature trees from the project that die shall be removed and replaced with the like species with the minimum height of 10 feet. The applicant shall return to the ZBA at a public meeting for review and approval of the design of any temporary signage and any change to the approved permanent signage. Stormwater and drainage. Prior to the start of any work and the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall provide the building commissioner with the final stormwater pollution and prevention plan to address specific sedimentation, erosion, dust control, which illustrates at a minimum the location of measures such as hay socks, silt fence, sedimentation basins, and other erosion controls of the plan of record, and provide detailed construction sequencing and methods to protect the infiltration capacity of each infiltration system. A list of written procedures that outline the specific operation and maintenance measures for all stormwater drainage facilities, including any temporary facilities, and that shall be employed to minimize or eliminate the threat of transmission with mosquito-borne diseases to the residents of the project and nearby residents. Construction. Uh, prior to construction of any building permit, pre-construction meetings shall be scheduled with the applicant and the, and, and the town. Uh, Two twenty-one, a written construction Safety management plan shall be submitted to the fire chief and the building commissioner prior to the issue of the building permit. 22, the approved construction logistics plan shall be provided at the pre-construction meeting and shall cover the following items. I don't feel the need to read through each one of those. I think they're all before you and they're pretty, and they're pretty standard. 23, the approved construction logistics plan shall be subject to the following conditions. There shall be no exterior construction activity, including the fueling of vehicles on the project site before 7 and after 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday. There shall be no construction on the project site on the following legal holidays, New Year's Memorial, July 4th, Labor, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. The applicant agrees that the hours of operation shall be enforceable by the Amherst Police Department and or inspection services. Parking for contractors shall be restricted to the project site. No parking and idling and construction trucks, equipment, and any public right away. Blasting gives 24 hours notice. Project site shall be fenced during construction. Members to, uh, measures to control dust and debris. Uh, prior to the plan has to have prior to construction, physical barriers shall show the physical barriers to be installed in the tree protections of uh, within the clearing line. Tires shall be washed before they exit the site during construction location of every project. Stormwater disposal area shall be protected to prevent compaction. All cat spaces shall be protected from soil debris. No stumps, demolition material, or other construction material shall be buried or disposed of on the project site. 24, as part of the building permit application, the applicant shall provide the building commissioner with the name, address, and business number of the project manager. The applicant engineer of record um, and during the site uh, and construction phase shall visit the construction site. The special permit shall expire within two years from the date of that it is filed with the town clerk. 
unless there has been both been both recorded at the Registry of Deeds and substantial construction or, or use that's commenced within a two-year time period. So you've got you got to get this done within two years, okay? And construction shall be completed within 24 months. You got to start within two years with substantial uh, construction, and construction must be completed within 24 months from the date of issuance of the building permit. All right. Okay. Mr. Now there's one that we wanted to talk about, which was the uh, EV, um, the EV site, and we wanted to have that the EV stations located on the construction plan. So can we add one? I'd like to add one condition to do that, either in the parking, um, uh, the, the parking notice condition or independently. And, and uh, to clarify um, how many, um, uh, what's the number of EV charging stations on, on in the parking lot to be provided? What is the requirement? Is there a state requirement for new construction? And for this, it'd be nine units. I guess it's not for the whole 189 be for nine units, so. Uh, this would be a requirement of uh, a condition of approval. Right. So whatever uh, you, you, whatever uh, you want. Yeah, so, you know, for other projects, you've um, required one, for example. Um, has the applicant given thought to the number of EV stations that you're likely to need over the next few years or, or given thought to preparing to have enough um, cable and enough power to get out to EV stations, more than one EV station? What's your thought on that? Yeah, we, we don't, you know, as Jeff pointed out, we don't really know what the electrical requirements are and so forth. And so is it a piece of cake to do more than one or is it a massive, we just don't know enough yet. Um, I know that, um, and, and we do have some, we have a resident who already has one in their garage, for example. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's a capacity to do it. I just have, I hate to say, oh, you know, we can do a couple and then find out we can't. Um, um, how, how about if the condition says a minimum of one EV charging station? Yeah. So yeah. they could do at least one, but if they want to do additional ones. That's what's hard about the EVs. I don't. I, I know that we. It's gonna. We're gonna have a greater need than we, than we currently have, and it's gonna be a lot of demand for it. But we don't have a really. We don't have a direction as to how much we ought to be uh, requiring of new construction, and what the cost is yet. It's really something that the board has to think about, and, and well, the whole country does. But the board has to think about what we want to do with this. So a minimum of one, and if you're in in the course of if that doesn't mean there can't be more than one. And in the course of your exploration of this, you find out that you have, you have the capacity and the interest in doing more, put it on the building plans. And so it's available, okay? Sounds right. great, yep. All right, are there any other conditions that people wish to speak to or um, before we go on to making our findings? Okay, this is gonna be a little different. I have not done a PERD before. Um, which is, so this is the first for uh, while I've been on the board. Um, so we have to make a number of, of findings for these planned unit um, residential developments. Um, so if you proceed to page six of the project application report. Um, the first 4.40, 4.41, are descriptions of what's required four point and then it describes the other things that are required in the PERD uh, and for a for a uh, planned what is it a planned unit residential development um, the one we have to consider is 4.421 which is the um, density and intensity of land use and the staff has reviewed it and found that there is sufficient land use. Indeed, the, um, there's a, if you look in the, on 4.421, there's um, 1.6 million square feet of land remains. Therefore, the approved 13 single family dwelling meets the minimum lot requirement under section 4.421. Number two is 4.4211. Again, that's a land question. 
um, and there, there um, is more than sufficient land that remains. So I think we can find that they meet the requirements for 4.211. And again, if anybody objects, uh, just speak up. I'm looking at the paper and I'm not looking at the screen. So you have to vocalize your desire to speak. Um, 4.4212 1, 4 um, is dealt with in 4.213 and that's proposing an expansion of the non-conforming dimensional standards requirements for the maximum density laws for multifamily units under section uh, 4.423. Um, I guess I'm confused about that one, Maureen, but it doesn't look like we have to make a decision on that until we get to 4.4215. Is that correct? Um, I have to make a finding on anything until 4.215. So the, um, you do need to make a finding regarding section 4.4213 um, as, as uh, the applicant is uh, seeking relief under section 9.22. Um, so uh, I guess to give a little background information. So that this part development was originally uh, approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals under ZBA FY 1985-04. And um, the, the governing bo zoning bylaw at that time, which was from May 1984 bylaw, did not permit townhouses or multifamily uses, uh, which are uh, use, use types that are allowed in a PERD. Uh, for, however, for some reason, the ZBA approved 45 multifamily units and 90 uh, uh, um, what was called retirement apartments, which are multifamily units under that 1985 special permit. So since that 19, 1985 special permit approval, the zoning by bylaw has been updated to allow townhouses and multifamily uses under a PERD. The previously the previous approved uses and number of units have been reclassified as follows. So the um, thir there's 32 townhouses, the 30 um, 32 uh, townhouses and 103 multifamily units. So under the current zoning bylaw, the additional lot area per family requirement for each of the 32 townhouses and 103 multifamily uses use, yeah, units is 20,000 square feet. There's no remaining lot, uh, lot area to account for this additional lot area per family requirement under the section. However, it's been deemed that these uses in dimensional standards to be pre-existing non-conforming. So the applicant is not altering or expanding the, uh, the applicant's not altering or expanding the, the existing townhouses. Therefore, the board doesn't need to take action on that, but they do need to, yeah, the board does need to take action on the expansion of the non-conforming dimensional standard requirement for the maximum density allowed for the multifamily units as they're um, increasing that non-conformity with their proposal of nine additional multifamily units. It's a lot to digest, but I hope I uh, explained that well. <laughs> I'm not troubled by the lot coverage for this, the new, and I would find that it's, uh, we have, we'll get to 9.2, 9.22 in a second. So, um, I think we make the, the finding we have, the next finding we have to make are 4.215, 4.216, 4.217, and 4.217. These all deal with dimensional regulations and they all deal with the fact that we have a pre existing, non conforming pre existing condition um, and we have a sufficient open space. So um, I think we can find that. They meet the requirements under, um, you can find they meet the requirements under 4.412, 1, 6, 1, 7, 1, and 1, 5. 4.218 is percentage of dwelling units of any one type. Uh, it meets this because of the um, dispersion of different uh, building types and unit types. This meets the, it does not exceed the maximum amount allowed and therefore meets section 4.4. 4.218 
4.4219 deals with parking requirements as regulated by Article 7. Um, and for this, the proposal, as we know, does not meet the parking space requirements by 36 spaces, but um, we want to, we, we believe that it does not, uh, we can waive that application, uh, waive the, the application of Section 7, uh, and so I guess it's 7.9 uh, at the later point when we come to the waivers. And so therefore we can find that um, the applicant we make the waiver for the parking requirements and um, the 159 spaces are deemed to be sufficient for um, this this project. And that's because of the nature of the, the clients and the residents of the, of the project don't have a lot of cars. And I don't see that changing much in the, in the future. In, in design standards and parking plans, do we have to do anything else under the, the PERD? Are we done with the PERD? Okay, so. good. Uh, we won't have another PERD for another five years, so <laughs> we got through that okay. All right, paving um, under the, the requirements of the uh, conditions will a lot will provide for this. On slope, the proposal meets the requirement. Setback from building, the proposal meets the requirements. Uh, dimensions, markets, market, marking and delineation. Um, there's not proposing any additional parking spaces, therefore this selection is, this section is not applicable to this project. Ent entrance and exit driveways are not changing anything there, so this is not applicable. Landscape standards, um, it's not proposing any additional parking spaces, so that's not applicable. Uh, parking on 25 or more spaces, um, this, this is not applicable. Uh, screening, existing screening is, is, is uh, sufficient. Article 9, this is the finding we have to make so that we can um, allow for the um, um, continued use of the non-conforming building. 9.22, the Special Permanent Granting Authority is authorized to act in the provision of Section 3.3 of this bylaw may, under a special permit, allow a non-conforming use of a building or structure land to be changed to a specific use not substantially different in character or its effect on the neighborhood or the property in the vicinity. The one we the portion we care about of 9.22 is that authority may also authorize under a special permit a non-conforming use of a building structure or land to be extended or a non-conforming building to be structured, altered, enlarged, or reconstructed, provided that the authority finds that such alteration, enlargement, or reconstruction shall not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use or non-conforming buildings. Um, I don't believe, I believe that we can find that this does not provide a um, a, a substantially more detrimental um, effect upon the neighborhood than the existing conditions and the existing buildings. So I think and so that would be as it relates to the um, alter um, the expansion of the um, I guess the density of the multifamily units. So they're adding nine more units to that yep. non-conforming building type or housing type, and then the and then they're expanding the non-conformity of the building heights for the Correct. common expansion and then the apartment tower. Correct. It, it seems to fit in well with the neighborhood. It's not going to be a, it's not going to be detrimental, significantly de detrimental to the existing uh, neighborhood than the, than the existing use. Section 10.38 findings required. 10.380 and 10.381, it's, it's uh, located in a neighborhood which is proposed under the town deeds appropriate. This is located in a PERD. It's been located there for a long period of time. 10.382, 383, 385, 387, mostly all deal with different ways in which the um, property could uh, offend or provide a nuisance to the neighbors. Um, I don't think this, is, this significantly increases that, and they do pr provide dark sky compliant lighting. 10.384 of, of adequate facilities for the proper operation of the proposed use. There's utilities there, and with the current use, it's, there's no reason that it isn't adequate for the, the proposed new use. 10.386 um, you have to be the proposal requires in conformance with the parking waivers, with the parking and sign regulation 
we uh, will, are granting a waiver under section 7.9 for the parking requirements. 10.387 proposed provides convenience, safe vehicular tra traffic. We find that, that there is safe vehicular and pedestrian traffic on the site. 10.388 deals with adequate space for off street loading. We find that that is, that that is ap uh, not applicable to this project, it hasn't changed. 10.389. The proposal provides adequate methods of disposal and or storage for sewage ref refuge or recyclables. Um, three building additions will use the existing utility disposal services, which are sufficient. 10.390, the proposal ensures protection from flood hazards. This is not, I don't think this is a, the proposal meets the, the requirements. 10.391, the architectural style of the building um, does, um, um, keep with the architectural style of the existing property and there's uh, no unique or important natural historic scenic features 10.392 um, adequate landscaping uh, clearly makes that finding 10.393 provides protection for adjacent properties again from intrusion and nuisance of lighting and um, and again they're going to comply with dark high, dark sky compliant lighting which will not spill over to abutting properties Proposal of voice to extend feasible impact on steep slopes. There are no wetland resources here um, or associated buffers found within 100 feet of the premises. 10.395 does not create disharmony with respect to the grain use or scale of the architecture of the buildings. Um, and, and within the grounds abutting the real caves. The board needs to make a finding on whether the proposal is harmony with the risk of terrain. We have found that. We've already made a finding regarding the existing roof height and um, um, in the area that it does not um, significantly differ from that. And the board, I believe the board can find that this is in harmony uh, with the rest of the terrain use and scale of the buildings. 10.396, the proposal provides screening for storage areas. Um, it's already there. 10.397, the proposal provides adequate recreation facilities. There's a lot of open space. 10.398 proposals in harmony with the general purpose of the intent of the bylaws and the goal of the master plan. Um, I think it isn't. I think this is clearly within the goal of the master plan. Um, Section four, objective H.3, which encourages opportunity for proper infill development. The board needs to determine whether the proposal meets the applicable zoning sections, including 4.4. Yes. Section 9.22. We've done that. 10.3. 3 and 10.38, which we've already done. So um, as a result, I think we've had the findings uh, that we needed to make, um, including the findings in 9.2, 2 and the PERD findings. We've done our 10 point, we've done our section 7 findings and section 10 findings, 10.38 findings. Um, I'm prepared to uh, consider a motion to approve the application, for the special permit with uh, conditions uh, based on our findings and with conditions. Um, do I have such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> All right. Is there any discussion on the motion? So to restate it, the motion is that we approve the special permit application based upon the findings we, with the findings we made and based upon the conditions required. The vote requires a uh, uh, roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. The vote is five to nothing. Vote unanimous and it passes. Congratulations. You've got your special permit and good luck with your building project. Thank you so much. We'll invite you over. Uh, we just the problem is that there's going to be so much there's so much demand for your product that uh, it'd be great if you could even have more but oh you've done well with we this agree. Yep. Yes, it looks thank really nice. you so much looks really Come nice over anytime thank you so much you bet thank you good night thank you everyone thank you thanks jeff thanks have a good night good night thanks, matthew the next order of business is public comment uh, on any matter that was not raised in the um, meeting today, tonight. So if any member of the public wishes to speak on a matter that was not before the board tonight, now is the time to do that. I don't see anybody raising their hand. If not, 
The last order of business is uh, items not considered in the last 48 hours or new business. I'll just give a quick report. Um, at our last meeting, we spoke about the fee structure for special permit applications. I said I'd meet with the, um, with the town staff as well as the chairman of the planning board. We had that meeting earlier this week. We came up with a, um, we're asking, staff is gonna review this, but with a, a agreement in principle to have um, $500 instead of $300 application fee for uh, commercial products and for um, larger uh, applications and that for um, single family homes and duplexes, owner occupied single family homes and duplexes, something in the 150 range. Uh, staff want to take a look at that to see what that would do to the budget and the likelihood of, of um, reducing the costs. Um, and I think we'll hear back from them, but we'll have something more formal in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I'll report back to you at that point. And we can talk about the relative merits of the, of the um, proposal, proposed fees. Um, Maureen and Rob, is, does that accurately reflect our discussion and, and where we're at? Okay. So we'll probably put that, we could, let's plan to put that on the October 13th agenda. So we said we said we'd try to do it in October, early October, and I think we can probably meet that deadline. Good. All right. Is there anything else that people wish to discuss? Mr. Maxfield. Uh, one, I'll just say thank you for that, Mr. Chair. I like I like that schedule. That's a that's a good fee schedule. The, uh, <laughs> the second thing I wanna I wanna ask is I, I don't know if you guys know my my change of scenery here. I uh Move my computer around. I've moved it out of my room, so on and so forth. Uh, just to me is, is reminding me more. What is there any any updates on on what's going to be happening uh, with returning to in person at any point? Uh, I, I I have a I ha I can't help but have a suspicion that the expiration of the virtual meetings is set to February, right when coincidentally we'll see a spike in COVID numbers and need to extend it again indefinitely. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I, I, is it is it mandated that that we be, um, or is it is it mandated that we be remote, or is it simply an option for us? And is that something we want as a board want to start discussing for maybe as we go down the line, especially if if this ends up getting extended? Because I know I personally, uh, I I didn't just join the CBA to do Zoom meeting bureaucracy personally. <laughs> And maybe other people did. I don't know. Maybe that has an appeal to someone. But uh, you know, I, I, I for one would like to like to get get in person with everybody at some time in the foreseeable future, rather than uh, distance. So I, I don't know what people's thoughts are on what they would want to do with that. One, and then two, if we even are allowed to do it, um, does does anyone have any information on that or any thoughts on that? You know, I I don't I don't know what the except I'm, I was under the impression that we needed to still do Zoom, but Rob and Maureen, what's the, what's the direction number one from the town and number two from the state? So the state is offering the ability to continue with the remote meetings through next year. Uh, and I think Dylan, you know, like we saw twice now, the decision to extend it comes you know, the last couple of days leading up to that expiration. So I, I guess I wouldn't expect anything more than that uh, next round. But uh, as far as locally, uh, at this point, the council has made the decision that uh, all boards meet remotely until, you know, another decision is made. So certainly this board could, uh, if they had an opinion about it or wanted to, um, you know, share that and, and make recommendations to the council to reconsider that at some point, they certainly could do that, but uh, that's where we are today. Nobody uh, except for the council is meeting in person. And that mainly has to do with um, being able to offer the remote uh, means as well. It's a very complicated uh, you know, endeavor to bring, uh, bring in the staff that's needed and to be able to host the, the meeting remotely and in person concurrently. And we're just not able to staff that for all the boards and committees. So we would be giving up the remote portion if we were going uh, back to in-person meetings whenever that occurs, uh, unless there's some new solution that's found between now and that time. 
So it's a real question for the town. The hybrid meeting is expensive and we don't have the, the bandwidth and or the, the personnel to do the hybrid. You want to do a hybrid meeting, at least for the time being. I'd love to be all together with everybody, but I, I think that the town, would, it's, I would assume the town would want to keep the option for people to to comment or to report in on, on a remote basis, right? Yeah. I think I think that would be the, the suggestion at this point, yes. Yep. Well, so what we could do is we could raise our fees to like maybe $1,500 and pay for the bandwidth. We could do that, right? <laughs> no, it sounds like we've got some more money coming in. <laughs> I, uh, I think I think that new money is already spoken for. So <laughs> I think it was already spent. But yeah, that it's really a question of dollars, isn't it, Rob? Right now and staff time. And, and staff time, it, you know, yeah. it requires at least one IT staff person with every meeting uh, to make sure that that's uh, you know things things go as needed for the council. So uh, you know, when you think of the fifty or so committees that we have, if you know any number of those decided to do a hybrid meeting, we could never, we could never staff that and, and support that. So Dylan, I, I really do um, sympathize and agree that I, I, I desire to be in a, a, a face-to-face -face meeting. I haven't had a single meeting that I've chaired. I've been a, a board member and had um, you know face-to-face -face meetings, but I haven't chaired a single face-to-face -face meeting yet. And I think it's, um, I, I, I would really, like that not to be my legacy, um, the Zoom chairman. So, um, but I just don't think right now that the town is ready to let us back in. I, Rob's points refreshed my memory from a discussion with the town councilor I had about it not too long ago. But I would sure be yeah. nice to see your faces in person. I think Tammy's raised. Tammy. I, I also, I, I love the idea of meeting in person, but I will say that the Zoom meeting makes it more accessible to many people. Mm -hmm. And I know for a lot of people driving into town from Boston or wherever they're coming from, and then, you know, sitting for two to three hours waiting for their meeting time to come up is a little bit, is a hardship. And I, I personally am very happy that I am not having to go out to my car now and drive home. So, because I don't live close to town. <laughs> so, Amen. Yeah, yeah. So, but I do think accessibility wise, I, I do like the Zoom meetings for that. I mean, because you can be on Cape Cod or you can be, we can be on vacation. It makes it so that, you know, there's more opportunity to have um, everybody available. Columbia. So, I think there's pros and cons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take vacation where there's no Zoom, though. There's oh. no Wi-Fi. We'll find you. We'll yeah. give you a hotspot. We'll pay for hotspots. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's an old technology. I remember that. I remember those. All right. I'll be in Bonaire in January, and if anybody wants to have the meeting down there, that'll be fine. If you want to have a meeting out at the Cape at my house, you're welcome to come. Uh, just one, one more thing I want to mention. I, I, I know it's Thursday night and I, I, I want to go watch the football here, but uh, I do want to mention, because I, I was thinking about this when I was looking at that, that security guard issue from uh, before, of just thinking of, in, in a lot of cases, when we talk about how we do any sort of enforcement, it seems like our only real enforcement is to uh revoke somebody's special permit which i think in almost every case is is a little bit extreme um especially when you're talking about where people are renting where you say well you know if you don't comply with this then what, what are we really going to do about it i think we should start thinking maybe have an administrative meeting sometime in the future when maybe we have a lighter workload or something like that um imposing in conditions um maybe some type of fees or fines should can specific conditions be violated of something and I, I the only reason i thought about it was something like a security guard would be well well you can always say well we couldn't find a security guard and it's like well how hard were you looking you could have a, something in there that's like well it's a penalty of whatever amount per day that that goes unfilled beyond some day without some you know, really make some reasonable accommodation, something like that. 
I don't know. It's something I've been thinking about because I, I don't think we're ever going to be revoking a special permit, especially to a large residential area, unless it was something extremely grievous. Um, so I don't know. Have we done something like that in the past? Is that something we would want to consider in the future for imposing on conditions? No, we're, we're of course, speaking in, in a hypothetical here and on um, something that um, is a general issue and not related to any specific application. But not this one, just, yeah, just yeah, some yeah. general thing like that. I think, you know, I, I think there are, there, aren't there penalties for violations of some of the, I mean, for some of the conditions because they violate the, the building code or they violate other kinds of things in town that we force them to, that conditions force people to comply with. But I don't know about, say, uh, if we had a condition that said your grass has to be uh, mowed when it reaches three, three inches, three feet or three inches or whatever and it isn't done if there's an ability for us to say and if you do you don't do it that we impose a fine or there's a fine imposed automatically by law rob is there any anything like that yeah any, any condition of the permit that's in violation can result in the fines being assessed the non-criminal disposition uh is for any provision of the bylaw any provision of the conditions of the permit i think you know it does it does help us to be as specific as you want to be. So, uh, you know, giving deadlines for things to occur by a certain date makes it really clear for us because otherwise we're, you know, we're working with the, the issuance of the certificate of occupancy or some, some date that we're, you know, making up on our own and deciding how much tolerance we give to that or flexibility we give to that. So, uh, more specific, the better, but, uh, and, and to drive the point to the applicant, you can state it in a condition that you're uh, really concerned about seeing enforced, uh, but know that any violation of any condition could, will result in the penalty. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Thanks for the information, Rob. All right. I don't think there's, is there anything else for anybody uh, in terms of comments, questions? All right. Uh, if not, if I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Mr. Maxfield moves to adjourn. Is, do I have a second? Second. Mr. Gilbert seconds the motion. This is non-debatable and it requires a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks for your hard work tonight. And Rob and Maureen, can you stand for just a second? Um, sure. We'll stop the recording and just had a quick question.